Hi, this is Paul Speckman from Master. I'll see you in the Tampa morgue. What's up, everyone? This is Tony, and you're listening to the Tampa Morgue, episode number 23. And I am joined by my co-host, Mr. Ed Webb. What's up, dude? Mr. Anderson, what's going on, brother? Not much, man. Doing good. Just got in from uh, my kids had a little Christmas thing going on over at the school, out in the snow. You know, so it was, uh, they had like dancing gingerbread men, a bunch of little kids. But I got back in time to do this. So, you know, all is good, man. Um, so, you know, the, and just so you, everybody knows, the opening track that we just played was the single from the new master record that's coming out January 19th. The record's going to be called Saints Dispelled. The, songs, the song we just played is uh, Walk in the Footsteps of Doom. And we'll have Paul on in a few minutes, actually, to talk about a bunch of shit, including the new record. Um, but, Ed, you were saying that, that you just actually heard there's some tour. I actually didn't see this news yet, but there's actually a couple tours that got announced I did. I saw, I saw two of them. I saw Kelly from Atheist had posted and something big coming today in the morning. And then, uh, I saw it just released. So it's, 
uh, Atheist, Cryptopsy, and a band called Almost Dead touring Europe. Uh, it looks like, uh, the, so I, I believe it's somewhere around February, March. Um, there's two tours, so I'm getting the dates mixed up. But uh, that's the first one. And the other one is is for the States. It's a um, big one. Amana Marth, Cannibal Corpse, Obituary, and Frozen Soul touring the States. And, uh, you know, they're, they're playing Tampa. And I believe it's in May. So that'll be... That'll be cool. I mean, that's a pretty big. Where did tour. you say they're playing in Tampa? They're playing. They're playing. It's well for those who who don't know. It used to be called the Sun Dome, which is at USF, um, you know, University of South Florida, and now it's called the Youngling Center. Um, the, after, they named it after the beer because the beer, uh, fa- um, what you call distributor, is literally two minutes away on Thirtieth Street in Fowler. It's a it's a giant, um, you know brewery and the youngling so they they must have decided to take the rights to this to the sun dome uh because forever it was a sun dome i mean i seen a shit t- you i think you saw some bands there oh yeah shadows I've seen fall a bunch of lamb of god and uh slipknot played there i saw i've seen ozzy there on the no more tears tour <laughs> How fucking long ago was that? Oh, wow, yeah, that was. Um, remember the No More Tours? What was it? Yeah. No More Tours. Yeah. And, still, and well, obviously, he's speaking not of No More Tours, if... did you fucking see how Kiss ended their show at Madison Square Garden? Yeah, it was like a marketing thing, right? They you saw uh, that, the right? Whole, like Avatar, the whole, yeah, the, yeah. The whole we're not we're not fucking gone. We're avatars, and now they're going to continue on as fucking AI avatars. Dude, I that's... think the thing that bummed me out about that because you know, like most. I was a Kiss fan growing up, you know that. I mean, especially oh, yeah, you know, when I was young, when I was younger, I was really into Kiss, you know. And then you get into heavier music eventually, and I still, I still appreciate all the old Kiss records. But I think the thing that kind of bummed me out with the last show was, which I'm not a hundred percent surprised, but they never acknowledged like Ace or uh, Peter. Peter. Nope. And yeah. if you notice, they they even like a lot of people were commenting. You didn't even like because remember they ended with. Um, Oh, fuck. What did they end with? Uh, Because I I know God Gave Rock and Roll to You was them announcing the Avatar. Yeah, that was like the announcement of the Avatar. But I'm trying to think of what the last last song was. Was it Rock and Roll All Night? Um, hmm. Probably. That's usually what they always always I think it was. So anyway, whatever it was, like they ended and were saying, you know, goodbye, blah, blah, blah. And this big fireworks and, you know, they're all whole stage fire shit went. And, um. They didn't even acknowledge thank you to all the fans fucking for the last 50 years. You know, even like Tom, when I saw Slayer, they were on stage for five, ten minutes fucking waving, saying goodbye. You know, you could tell yeah. they gave a shit. But uh, Kiss just literally disappeared. And then that fucking bullshit came up. And I was just like, you know what, dude? It would be one thing if you announced that there's going to be four new dudes taking over young dudes that are going to fucking take the, the torch and run with it, but doing some fucking avatar bullshit. I don't know. I, I think yeah. that set people off, man. Cause I noticed people were like, well, we'll see if they're really, we'll see if they're really gone, you know, I mean, um, and have really done, you know, it's uh, nothing surprises me. I have a feeling they'll probably do a residency or something, you know, they'll, there'll be something they do. I think I'm pretty sure they're fucking, they're rich enough, dude. I don't think they need to do this oh, anymore. They, they were rich enough like 10 years ago, I think. But you know who's not done is our next guest, right? I mean, this we have a guy who has a new record coming out. And Paul's been around for a long time, too. Um, and I think he's actually buzzing in now here. Welcome to the show, Mr. Paul Speckman. How you doing, man? I'm doing good, man. Great to be on the show. Thanks for yeah, getting, we, getting a hold of me, huh? No, we appreciate you coming on. And you just actually, you did some shows, right? You just got back from what? You did uh, Istanbul. Um, Georgia. You did what, three, three, yeah, Georgia. And Armenia. Yeah, these are these were crazy shows. Uh, it was like back in the 80s. Really great energy, you know? I How was Tbilisi? Like, Tbilisi really? you played in, right, in Georgia? Say it again? Tbilisi you played at in Georgia. Is that correct? Yeah, that show was okay. You know, there were probably 100 people there. That was okay, but the real shows were in... Turkey and Armenia, just really great energy there. Like in Armenia, in Armenia, they were jumping off the tables and shit. It was like nice. back in the eighties, you know, really heavy duty insanity, and they're going crazy. We had a blast, really. 
You know, and that's, that's, actually, that's actually interesting to ask you too before we start, you know, diving into your past and stuff. Now, you know, you obviously, you know, you played, you've been in the States, played shows in Europe. And is there, a, what would, before we start the real interview, what would you say is the, the big difference between the States shows, the States fans and the, you know, overseas? Well, it really depends on how big your band is. For some reason, uh, the stateside shows for Master are always really tiny. And people usually just stand there with their arms crossed, you know. As we're over here in Europe, the people are going crazy at festivals and even club shows. They're out of their mind for Master. I really don't have the answer, but for some reason, Master uh, never really hit it big in the U.S. Not to say that, you know, we're, we're big superstars here, but I'm just saying that they uh, show a lot more respect for Master here in Europe, to be quite honest with you. You know, South America, the uh, same as well, you know. I think that's for a lot of bands, man. I don't think, I think most people just stand there. They don't know what to do half the time. I mean, I've seen it time and time again, man, for like killer bands, people just stand there, like you said, looking, gazed and with their arms crossed. And it's just, what are you doing? Yes. Now you're, you're originally from Chicago, Illinois, right? The the Northwest suburbs. Is that correct? Yeah, sure. Okay. And I grew up in Mount Prospect, uh, a small, small city, uh, north, like you said, in the northwest suburbs. It wasn't really a huge scene there. More, more of the scene was in Chicago at the time, really. And you became a metal fan. You, well, you got into like, kind of like the metal records by digging through your brother's records. Because you're what? You're one of four brothers? Yeah, I had two older brothers and a younger brother. And and uh, in, in high school, uh, a friend of mine, Ron Cook, uh, he started turning me on to like Led Zeppelin and stuff like this, and uh, another friend turned me on to Black Sabbath. This was all good stuff. I was like maybe uh, 14 years old, and he uh, he had a band going on at that time. It was called White Cross, you know, named after Speed. You know, these young guys are. Anyway, and uh, at the time, they were looking for a singer, and I went and auditioned for the band. I'd never been in a band before. It was the first time, and we were doing cover songs from Led Zeppelin and UFO and like Ted Nugent, this kind of stuff. And I did my best, and I tried to be a cool metalhead guy, you know, whatever you want to say, heavy rock and roll guy. So I grew my hair out and stuff throughout high school. It got longer as the years went by. And anyway, eventually the band broke up. Ron uh, went to a band called Thrust. And, uh, and they, actually had some, they actually had some success for a while, Thrust. And I went in a band, uh, I joined a band called War Cry as their bass player. I yeah, told Rust had that 84 album, right? They had the 84 um, Fist Held High album, and I Fist think they still yeah, right. put out yeah. records. Yeah, sure. So he and I were really good friends, but our little uh, cover, whatever you want to say, pop rock band separated. He went his way, and I joined a band called War Cry with some local okay. friends in the neighborhood, you know? Yeah, because you guys, what well, in White White Cross, you guys only did what, like ten shows. But you guys, like you said, you were doing some covers. Yeah, that was what set. No, we were just doing you know, little high school get-togethers and you know churches and stuff, benefit things. We never made any money for it. I think I remember the guitar player's dad used to drive us to the shows and stuff in his car. It was really small-time stuff, but it was a good way to to uh, get into rock and roll. And, and I, I I caught the bug after that. I really did, you know. And you were fascinated by the bass player, right? Right away, you started watching the bass player. Yeah, so obviously you read that bio. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. We've done a little bit of, yeah, a little bit of research. And, and I said, oh, yeah, I, I'm going to play bass. And and uh, my neighborhood friend, Mike Baker, was telling me, oh, you, you're never going to learn how to play bass. Well, I, I showed that motherfucker. I used to sit in my bedroom for seven <laughs> or eight hours every day. My dad would hand me the paper and say, go get a job. And I'd wait till he went... Uh, to work and, and funeral bitch would go to, to work as well. And my brother and stepsister did go to school. I'd go back to bed, you know, I'd sleep for another two, three hours, get up, start playing bass all day until I got home. And then I'd go out and hang out with my friends, try and get out of the house before they got home from work, you know. And your I first was bass was the Epiphone? So, yeah, I, yeah, the Epiphone, sure. The Gibson, you know, cheap Gibson Epiphone, but yeah. But it was cool, you know, whatever. Like I said, I taught myself how to play just by listening to records and trying to copy them, you know. I'm sure everybody did that in the early days. Come on. 
you know, you're self-taught, right? You only had like one lesson and the guy couldn't teach you the song you wanted to learn. So you pretty much said, fuck it. Yeah. That, that, that break and killers. I do. For, you know, for a guy who wasn't playing bass so long, that was a hard part to figure out. And, and I, actually for a good bass player is a hard part to play. A point is, is that uh, I thought, you know, if I'm going to take lessons, this guy's going to figure this part out. He said to me, oh, you know, if there's something you want to want me to teach you or whatever, I'll show you. I went there and, he, you know, he didn't have it. He, he didn't take the time to even figure it out. So I went home and stuff, and uh, I listened to that record all afternoon one day, and I figured it out myself, and I said, well, what the fuck do I need lessons for? I never talked to the guy again, you know? There you go. You know. That seems like a current theme. I did the same thing. Learn, I took the number of the beast and I watched a guy literally play it, turn it off. And then he found the root note and started doing that. And I was like, well, dude, I can do that myself. So I was like, not exactly. coming back. Now, Paul, you credited draw the line, right? That was the first record you pretty much were fucking with on the bass. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Draw the line. Great Aerosmith record. I liked this to the first three or four albums from Aerosmith. You know, obviously later on, they, they made a lot of money and went commercial. I know that. Good for them. But those early records are great, yo. Adam Sample, that was a really good song. And obviously, Draw the Line or Kings and Queens. I mean, these are some great Critical songs. Mass, yeah. That's to listen to them today. You know, of course, Toys in the Attic. These are still yeah. great songs in my mind, you know. They're still like on rotation in the car, you know. When we're going to shows, I'm listening to old Aerosmith sometimes too, yo, of course. Exactly. The real old school stuff is yeah. the best. You know, and you're influenced by like what? So Lemmy, um, Chris Squire from Yes, guys like that, uh Geezer Butler. Steve Harris. I mean I obviously Steve Harris. obviously I, I'm not as good as these guys are, but point is is I developed my own style and, and I took a little bit from each of them, and that's what you do, yo. You're trying to to uh cre- you know to be yourself, of course. You know, and that's what I recommend right. for younger guys. You know, go ahead and Check out all these different bass players, including me, if you want. But you got to come up with your own version. You know, you can't just uh, copy these guys and play the way they do exactly. You have to come up with your own technique. And so you listen. To, you, know, you understand, Ed? You you listen to a bunch of bass players or guitar players, and you put it all together, and you come up with your own way. And that, that's that's the best way to do it. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. Because imitation is the greatest form of flattery. But man. There's already a dude doing the same thing. How about let people learn who you are by doing your own? Thing? Exactly. I'm That's hoping that I'm exactly. doing my own thing. I always thought it was anyway. <laughs> oh, for sure, man. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, always for the most part, you guys have always yeah. been three piece, right? I, I like it better that way because you, so, you're not like trapped into playing what the guitar player is playing. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. So it makes when the guitar player is doing a lead, you yeah, you can do whatever the fuck you want. That gives, That's you know, what I always thought was the you best. You got about that it. right. You don't always yeah. have to do the same thing yep. they're doing. You come up with your own crazy run from hell, and just make sure you get back into the part yep. when it's time to go back to the part. I always thought right. that was exactly. the best thing. You know, that's why I always liked about Rush as well. For example, you know, oh, I like yeah. the idea that uh, they weren't always playing the same thing. Okay, some parts, but but Not you know, close. during the solo. You do whatever the fuck you want. That was always the best way. Same with Motorhead. I always liked Motorhead because of that as well. Yep. Lemmy was always doing his own thing when yep. when they were three piece. You know. Yeah, and he created his own bass tone. I mean, he took something nobody was doing and made his own thing and made the Rickenbacker one of the most well known yeah. instruments out there That's because right. you know, I mean, people didn't realize that that thing weighed about a hundred pounds. You know, and Lemmy was what? Buck 40, six, buck 50 soaking <laughs> wet, maybe, you know, holding that fucking that tree yeah, yeah. trunk. You know, I bought one and took it right back. I was like, there's no way I can hold it. And I'm a big, you I'm know a that, big uh, dude. You know, it was like, also this. heavy that I, the first one I got was that, uh, I, obviously I was copying Steve Harris. I bought that uh, 1981 uh, Fender Precision. That was a fucking heavy one, too, yes. man. Mm. Yeah, man, I had the I had the P bass deluxe, you know, with the uh, P and the yeah. and the humbucker, and man, I would be like, holy shit, this thing because it's yeah, real it was, like, dragging me down. So it, it, that's why they sound sure. so good. Yep, compared to my first bass, which I had a Hondo, a Hondo Explorer, and I'll never forget 
learning how to play on that thing with this. You never knew about action and the strings. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember those days. Sure. You just learned how to play. Yeah, man. Made yeah, you sure. better. I think. Exactly. You know? that, 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 the first couple of bases I had, you're right. I didn't know anything about action. It was like fucking nope. ridiculous, you know? I agree with you. But you're right. It made you better because somehow yep. you you figured the songs out anyway and thought that was normal. And then years later, you found out, right. hey, dude, uh, you know, you're, your action's too high. You know, you need to lower the action so you can play better. <laughs> right. And then all of a sudden, you're playing like a superstar because you've been forcing exactly. all those years. This, this yeah. is true. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So it, you were playing bass, and then you met. So with Warcry, you had what met Steve in his parents' driveway when he was working on a car, and then you had mentioned. So I had, yeah, read, I had you had, had mentioned it. One of those uh, Volkswagen bugs, you know. Oh yeah. And he and I obviously we were in, in uh, <laughs> grade school together all the way from kindergarten, and I hadn't seen him in a long time. The last time I saw him, we were in Cub Scouts actually, and Cub I, Scouts. obviously you know we were younger Cub Scouts. You know now oh we were God. teenagers, and he had long hair and. I had long hair, and he's working on his Volkswagen Beetle or whatever. And and I'm like, man, uh, what's going on? I haven't seen you in all these years and stuff. And he's like, oh, I'm, I'm just starting to learn how to play guitar. And, you know, I'm like, oh, really? I'm learning how to play bass. Maybe we should get together and see if we can play together. And obviously we did. You know, and he had me. another buddy, right? That's how Marty got involved? Yeah, Marty and uh, Vince, uh, the two twins, were on the other side of the block, like behind Steve's house. And. And Marty wanted to play too, so we we were just a three piece for a long time, till we found a drummer, another guy in high school. We started rocking together. And that and was slowly, Joe, right? Slowly we started, yeah, Joe Iceno. So we slowly we started playing some shows together and stuff. You know, opening and for it, bands like Mountain, and and uh, we ended up opening up for Twisted Sister. Some really good shows, actually. So you opened up for Twisted Sister. Was that um, the You Can't Stop Rock and Roll tour? Yeah, uh, Queensrÿche was the support band on that one. Okay, and that was at Haymakers, that gig? Wow. Yeah, and what the crazy 83. thing about this one, and I still tell it today, is that Queensryche were on a tour bus. They just had that uh, Queen of the Reich uh, EP just came out, so this is a long time ago, and Twisted Sister were riding in a broken-down van. for over. They, uh, Dee Snyder told me they had over 220 shows or something that year. He said, we're driving around in a van, Queensryche is in a bus, you know, and we're the headliner. I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever, you know. <laughs> He said, you know, it's a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll. And, exactly. You know, he was talking to me and stuff. Like, I caught the guy in the bathroom. He was shaving, you know, and I started laughing at him, you know. And I'm standing in the urinal pissing, and I'm laughing at the guy. I'm looking over, it's Steve Snyder, and he's shaving. And he's, he's, he said, what's going on? I said, oh, I'm not, nothing, man. Sorry. Don't mean to laugh at you. He said, well, Jesus Christ, I'm on the road, and I don't even get a chance to shit and shave sometimes. And I said, I'm one of the, guy, one of the peons from the local support band. Hey, don't you ever call yourself a fucking peon again, man. We're riding around a van. This is a living hell. But you know what? If you, if you stick to your guns, you can do something, man. I'm living proof. And, you know, maybe two years later, they That's had right. the rock. Stay hungry, they right? Taken. They were huge. This was like maybe only two years later. I think this was maybe, I think we maybe we played the shows with them, I think, in 1983. But yeah. within, within two years, they're on MTV and stuff. Next time I saw them, they're riding in the tour bus. But the one thing I got to say is when I saw Twisted Sister the next time, I think they were playing like the Rosemont Horizon, which was a big step from this club with 800 people. Anyway, this was a huge uh, sold-out show. They were playing the Rosemont Horizon. I knocked on the bus door, and surprisingly, some of the guys really got out of the bus and were talking to me and were really cool. They weren't dickheads at all. Not yet. Maybe later. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. It takes a while. This time they right. were really friendly, you know. The, right. The the bass player, uh, Mark the Animal Mendoza, he's like hitting on my friend's mom. She's a cop. And he's like, oh, you know, before Twisted Sister, I was going to be a New York cop. And he's got his arm around her. <laughs> I'm laughing. Listen to his bullshit. It's funny, you know. That was a good time, is my point. They were good people. And you also saw, you also saw what, 82? You saw the Blizzard of Oz tour, right, with yeah. Motorhead. They were on the Ace of Spades tour. That So you saw Randy play. 81, Joe. 81. So that, and you saw Randy play. Yeah, I saw Randy play, uh, I think, probably three times, Joe. You know? I met oh, Ozzy wow. on, that, on the first, uh, wow. on the Motorhead Ozzy show, or, or whatever, Motorhead Support. I met Ozzy on that special radio thing, you know, it was like, I saw that photo actually. First ninety-eight people uh, to buy the the LP, you know, when vinyl was still happening. You buy the LP, and 
Ozzy signs it there, and then he gives you a ticket to the crazy train. And it was just the L train going, going around through a really shitty neighborhood, but you were at least safe in the L. And Ozzy would sit, uh, come up and sit down next to you with two security guards, and then you get get to talk to him for maybe one minute, and they took a Polaroid of you. I still got the Polaroid. That was I a saw the photo, experience. right? That was the one you put up, That's I think, awesome. that you put up uh, not too long ago. Yeah, happy yeah. birthday, Dad. I'm just teasing, you know. Yeah, 75. Yeah, I was just teasing, you know. It's just cool to have that photo with the guy. Cool to have that Polaroid and that memory, you know. And then, obviously, like you said, saw Randy yeah. that night. That was awesome. Then I saw Randy. That was at the Aragon Ballroom. Then I saw Randy again, the Rosemont Horizon. This was also great. I think Motley Crue might have been the support band. I'm not sure. Maybe. I don't remember exactly, but it doesn't matter. I saw. I managed to see him three times, so that was great. That's awesome. Yeah, that's 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 very cool. And uh, so you guys were doing War Cry, and then so, so Joe didn't last very long, right? And I think you had Bill Schmidt before Rich even joined, right? The vocalist. Yeah, but he was in the band uh, for one show, one concert. One we show. got in a fight because uh, because he or Marty, I really don't remember at the time anymore. They blame each other, but somebody screwed up the song Black Sabbath. The end like the last little section, the last 10 seconds. And, and uh, Bill threw a stick at Marty. It might have been Marty's fault. It might have been Bill's fault. I don't remember. It's such a long time ago. But then, uh, you know, at that time, Marty was like sort of like the leader of the band, War Cry, and he didn't want to jam with him anymore. So then uh, we started jamming with Joe, again, uh, you know, and, and started playing these big shows, like I said. And uh, Bill said to me, you know, I Marty turned me on to that Venom 7-inch, uh, I was live like an angel, die like a devil on one side and leave with Satan on the other. And it pretty much changed my life. You know, at the time I was listening to Motorhead and GBH and Minor Threat and Discharge, starting to get a little heavier, you know, more, more out of the heavy metal stuff, which I was a big fan of, of course. <coughs> Excuse me, I had a cough. But anyway, so then uh, I sent this uh, uh, four to seven inch over to the drummer, Bill. And he liked it so much. And then he started pushing me through War Cry. And, oh, you know, maybe you should quit that band and let's get together and do something heavier, man. I'm thinking about this band called Master. What do you, what do you think? You know, you'd be perfect for it, Paul. Get away from these posers. I don't, you know, War Cry sucks, you know. It's a pop band. It's commercial. Blah, blah, you know. And they were and getting got, more commercial, right? War Cry started get, becoming more commercial. Yeah, they, they became more commercial at the end there. And I, I did leave the band. They were like, uh, they wanted to be the next Motley Crue, and they, they moved to Hollywood after that and stuff. I left. Before. They changed their name, didn't they, too, to like Tommy yeah, Gun? To Tommy Gun and some other name, too, I forget now, but whatever. They went one direction, and I stayed in Chicago. And me and Bill started getting together writing songs, you know, looking for a guitar player and stuff, and we finally found somebody and got it together, you know, and started playing. We played only one show. Because uh, the original drummer, that Bill, he didn't, he didn't like to practice. We never practiced. He believed that you should practice in your head. I still laugh about it. Today, I still <laughs> laugh about it. Well, you just practice in your head. You know, you keep playing the songs in your head, and then when we get together, we'll play them. Well, believe me, after not practicing for a year and getting together to play the six songs live for like 30 minutes at the show, I was fucking dying there trying to sing six songs, never practiced and never singing them before. The first time live, I nearly had a heart attack. You know, I was in my early twenties at the time. Yeah, you know, obviously the, you got to rehearse for a show, man. Come on, the guy was a moron. That's why he's not here anymore. You know, and he, and he wanted to be not to jump ahead too much, but he wanted to be the vocalist. Actually, he wanted to do the vocals in Master at first. Is that is that correct? He did one song, and then he realized that uh, there's no way he was going to handle it. And when we were in the studio, like doing the demos, I never sang before. I took a stab at a couple of songs and the engineer at that time said, said he wanted me to sing them all. He said, you're a much better singer than Bill. You're going to have to sing them all. And of course, Bill, then he agreed. He had no choice, I guess, you know, and I took over as a singer ever since, obviously. Now with War Cry, you guys were on the 83 Metal Massacre 4 record, right? And, yeah, we um, had one song called Forbidden Evil, you know. And did you guys have to re-record that over? So you guys recorded that twice, right? Because you guys didn't have the original tapes from the... Uh... Well, actually, uh, we had the demos. You know, it was a demo, three-song demo trilogy of terror. Mm -hmm. And the guys wanted to go to a, to a nice studio in Wisconsin. It was called Pierce Arrow. They wanted to do something special. And what was really interesting is I remember when we went to the studio, I was on the way home from one of the auditions for one of the guitar players 
puking all over myself in my grandma's Ford Fairlane. I got home covered in puke, had to go in the house and take a shower, grab my bass, and go to record that song in Wisconsin with the band. They just <laughs> showed up after I took a shower. And then they smoked me on the, in the end. Wow. Uh, on the original demos, the bass was the loudest thing on there because I said, you know, they, they didn't want me to be there for the production. I said, make sure the bass is there. Well, the bass is ridiculous on the demo. It's so loud. It's the loudest fucking thing. It's great. The original demo is great. But on the uh, on the uh, Metal Massacre 4, you can't hear the bass at all. You don't hear it. There's no bass. It's kind of like modern Florida or whatever later Florida technology where, where you know, where Burns uh, would record with no bass, you know. I remember, like, yeah. when we were doing, just to jump, jump ahead for a second, we were doing On the Seventh Day, and we actually had a decent bass sound on that record. We went out to Burns' car, and he told me the bass was too loud. And I scratched my beard. And he would mix and, and uh, produce the record without me when I went home. And when I got the recordings, there was no bass on the entire album. One little part. You could barely hear the bass on the bass break. And it was just disgusting, you know. I got smoked. But anyway, I got smoked yeah. on that on that uh, Metal Massacre 4 as well. I got smoked on that one too, no bass. That doesn't happen to me now. That was a lot of bass yeah. on every fucking record for yeah, because 20 years. Like because the, the seventh, like you said, that album, that was the last time, right? You were not, pre- which we'll get to that album, but that was the last time you were not present for the mix, right? And the, you got it. The Never again, man. There's always bass on every fucking record I ever record. Sometimes there's too yeah. much, but for me, <laughs> there's never too much. Bass is important. Oh, no, you listen to like, you listen to Black Sabbath, that is a great example. Or Cream, the bass is loud, ridiculous, and that's how I like it, but even today. Point. Even yeah. sometimes the critics say, oh, there's. Too much bass on the album. I'm like, fuck you. Bass is an important instrument on a three-piece band. It can't yes. be quiet. It's got to be heavy. Anyway. And is it true that you did you did you yeah. really try out for? So you tried out for Trouble twice. Is that is that a fact uh, or is yeah, that? I tried out uh, the first time. Uh, first time I went in there, we did uh, Children of the Grave, uh, The Tempter. I think Bastards Will Pay. And uh, I had a fucking blast. But the, the funny thing was, is at that time. They used to call me the, the Speckman, the maniacal bass player, because I was a maniac then. I wasn't singing. I was just running around, jumping around like an idiot, like just a maniac idiot. And that's how I can describe it. I just remember the guy's in trouble. You know, Eric is standing there singing, you know, how he does, how he did. He doesn't oh, yeah. move. And I'm running around in circles around the guy, running around over here like like a, like a, like a track star or something, jumping up and down, shaking my head, you know, because that's the way I used to play at that time. I, I was still crazy in War Cry. I was a younger guy. I was kind of out of my mind, early 20s, you know. And I just remember going crazy in there and, and then thinking when it's all over, Jesus, I must have scared the crap out of them. And then I got a phone call a week later. Can you come back? And I'm like, oh, I'm in this band now, Master. And I, I really, I want to stay with my band, Master. But I do appreciate it. And then the, then uh, Sean, uh, Another guy from high school, he started calling me then for the next whole week. He's like, man, I want to compete with you, man. We go, to, we went to the same high school. You you burned me on that fucking base. You bought that base and got it before I got it. I wanted that base. <laughs> we got to compete. I'll teach you the songs. I'm like, Sean, it's not about teaching me the songs. I know how to play the songs. They're, they're great songs. It's all you, dude. Good luck. And, and unfortunately for... Sean McAllister, he was only in the band for, I don't know, maybe one album. And he quit for a chick or something. I, I really, it really disappointed me. And even today. It's always the downfall. <laughs> you know, I think he did the, maybe he did the first, maybe the first album or something. And that's it. He quit for a chick after that. And, and oh, just, wow. you know, wow, man, trouble went a long way after that. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't regret, you know, not going, okay, yeah, I should have gone for it maybe. Okay, but I, but I try to, but I don't regret it. But yeah, I, but, you did what you thought was right at the time. Yeah, but I do feel was, bad that that he quit so early. I was like, man, the guy could have been a superstar, man. You know, I, I think he was on MTV, MTV maybe even with the band, or maybe that was later. Uh, whatever. But he quit, and that shocked me a little bit, yo. Well, you guys had in Chicago. We, like, we definitely should mention that you guys had a great scene back then, right? You had like what. What we mentioned, obviously, Trouble. You guys had uh, E-Trope. Uh, uh, E-Trope was Witch great. Slayer. Snow White. Snow White, yeah. Uh, Thrust, of course, we mentioned Thrust already. And, and when you first started Master, it's kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but when you first started Master, 
Did you you had one of the guys from uh, Witch Slayer with you? Is that correct or is that not correct? No, I'll tell you what happened. Uh, I was playing with Warcry, and uh, like I said, the drummer wanted me to come and hang out with him and join this band master. <coughs> and Rick Manson, the bass player, maybe the second or third bass player, maybe the second one in Witch Slayer. Sean McAllister was in Witch Slayer before Trouble. Okay, so that was the point. Is that Trouble was coming to see me at shows with Warcry and going to see Sean with Witch Slayer, and that's kind of how this auditions came together. But anyway, then uh, then this guy uh, we call him Rick Ma- Manson or Rick Mexican, whatever. He he replaced Sean in in Witch Slayer, and then uh, he uh, like a cheating bitch. Bill decided one day because I was busy, whatever. One day. He went and played bass with Bill, and uh, some reason it didn't work out, and then I was back. So really, Bill wanted to get him, and then all of a sudden he changed his mind, and I was back. It's a strange stuff, yo. And unfortunately, Rick Rick uh, disappeared. I don't know what happened to him. I haven't seen him in thirty years. Uh, Bill, for, you know, the drummer for years, was homeless, uh, living in the woods, whatever, in the forest, and riding. His- Ride his bicycle, and I guess now he's in Florida. He ain't doing anything. Just talking. I'm talking about Bill. He's only just talking shit about me, and I gave him a lot of chances, man. Really gave him a lot of chances. I got him a record deal in 1990. We recorded that, or whatever, 89, and it came out in 90. We recorded that first master after he'd done nothing in his life. Same with the guitar player that had done nothing. I got him back together for a, a few days rehearsal, record the album, we split up again because the attitude was still the same. All of a sudden, uh, Bill wanted to take over the band. And I said, fuck you, dude. I put it together for you. I'm the leader of the band. Or we can do it together. Whatever. You know, maybe all three of us, I, I think I said. And he's like, oh, I'm the leader of the band. I said, fuck you, dude. You didn't do shit without me. You're not going to do shit without me again. And I fired him right away, a week later. I got a European tour for the Did band. Guys- it was like a European tour with a, with a master punch stench in the middle. And uh, Abomination, my other band, was an opening band. And uh, the guys uh, didn't want to do it. They, they were afraid to go to Europe. So I went without them. That was the end of it. Stupid. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, because you guys, what, when you guys first formed, you guys only wrote a few songs and broke up right away, right? You guys wrote, like, what? It was uh, Pledge of Allegiance, uh, Terrorizer, maybe, and Master. And you guys split up right after the first couple of tunes. The first, the first breakup, that was like, <laughs> yeah, what, because, uh, 80. Because what happened was, yeah. Because uh, Bill got the opportunity to join this band called Mayhem, uh, not not the one from Norway or whatever, not the Norway yeah, Mayhem one. Inc. Right? Or... Yeah, well, they, in the last few years they called it Mayhem Inc. But it was just called Mayhem at the time, and it was like uh, they had a cool singer, and uh, in my opinion, they were ripping off Iron Maiden, you know, which wasn't a bad thing. They were great players. Don't get me wrong, you know. The guitar player, um, he went a lot, a lot, you know, went on to do Louis Vitek. He went on to do a lot of things, Zetrobe and uh, MOD, and he, he did a lot of a lot of things. This guy, but I'm just saying at the time. Uh, so he was cheating on me, you know. He started jamming with, with these other guys, and my uh, father had just passed away. I think this was in probably 1984, 85, and uh, I decided in the basement of my father's house when we were selling it. That to write a song, and I wrote a song called The Truth, and you're right, it wasn't a master song, it was written for Death Strike and I wrote Pitch Guy and, and, and so obviously when we got back together with the master lineup, now we had more songs, we had The Truth we had Pay to Die uh, Chris and I wrote Funeral Bitch together Chris brought in Reentry and Destruction and uh, Unknown Soldier we did together, me and Chris, and this is how it all worked out you know? Yeah, and you mentioned Death Strike 84, right you guys did, so that was and the guitar, what you got, Chris, who was actually someone who had tried out prior for your prior with was it Warcry? Yeah, yeah, he, he tried out for like a, no, no, he actually tried out for Master, but Master. he was more a, a Judas Priest guy, you know, Twin Guitar Attack. Nothing wrong with Judas Priest. I love Judas Priest still today, even. But uh, Twin Guitar Attack, he wasn't the guy we were looking for. He he uh, had a mustache and he kind of looked like Mantis, you know. So we were like the perfect. Uh, Bill looked like uh, Abaddon and he looked like Mantis. And so we were like a perfect uh, cover band of uh, Venom, maybe. So we made him shave his mustache. He joined the band. He, he wrote some songs <laughs> with me, like I said. Uh, well, he, uh, obviously, he wasn't in the band first. So that he came to the Death Strike, still with the mustache. 
he and I wrote some songs together. And then Bill came crawling back after Mayhem kicked him out. He got fired from the band. Yeah. He came crawling back to me in 85. You know, can we, can I join your, your band, Death Strike, and all this kind of shit? We just did that fucking death demo, and life started happening in, in a way. Things were kind of cool, and then we, I made the mistake and took him back. You know? Yeah, because didn't wasn't the trouble was that, that you had a drummer named John at that time, right? And yeah. he couldn't play right. one of the songs you had wrote in Pray to Die, which which I actually mentioned earlier. He yeah. could he had trouble recording that, right? And you kind of that's how Bill got back into the fold. Well, I called him and said, "Can you come and do this song, Pray to Die?" And then John got the song down, but this still put the the seeds to put us back together. You know, John was drinking too much at the time and walking around with his fucking. Uh, Big dog and the, and the dog, you know, the dog was shitting in our rehearsal room all the time. I remember that. Just a lot of stress with the guy. So we gave Bill a chance. Wow. You know, and uh, he never got his shit together. Bill was a fucking moron, you know. I told that, you, that, he never yeah. it, it fell apart again. You know. Then you guys got what eighty five. You guys went into the studio. What was it? Uh, sea Grape Studios. Yeah, yeah. Um, we recorded the demo. A seven the song demo. demo we released five songs and. And uh, sent the tapes around the cassettes back in the tape trading days, and and it got really popular. And you guys, so you guys made an appearance, right, on this guy named Don K's radio program on WBCR, a college radio show, and got kicked yeah. off the radio show. Mm -hmm. But you also almost got a record deal. But um, if you want to explain to us, Kim Fowley fucked that up for you. Yeah, that's Kim. No, that's Kim, not not King, but Kim Fowley. Not not King from deceased, but Kim yeah. Fowley, who was the Runaways Fowley, manager yeah, and stuff. Runaways, and he wrote songs for Alice Cooper and Kiss. Well, he told uh, Combat, you know, that he wanted to like, you know, I think the the offer was like maybe a thousand thousand dollars or something at that time. They didn't know what death metal was. This was a whole new genre. And I think they offered us a thousand, and they wanted us for like four albums or five albums, a big crappy deal, you know. And he was like, "Oh, we need fifty thousand. Well, come on, you know, <laughs> they threw it in the garbage. You know that. And you know, we never heard another word. He charged me like a dollar a minute to read the contract and turned it into such a big thing that they just laughed and threw it in the garbage. Which That's you know, crazy. I read that. So he was actually charging you part of the minute of reading the contract. Yeah, a dollar a minute. A dollar a minute. That's wow. insane. And you were talking about tape trading, That's too. Ridiculous. And you guys, Death Strike and Master, those demos were very well received in the underground and you were, can you explain some of the guys you were having correspondence with back then? Oh, you know, uh, Bill Steer from Carcass. Well, he was in Napalm Death at the time. Yeah, yeah, I always tell this story because I remember he sent me a special Napalm Death patch. I got it somewhere in a box somewhere. It's worth, probably worth a ton of money now. But he's like, oh, I, I quit Napalm Death. I'm starting this new band called Carcass. And it's unfortunate that, you know, I got angry and, and disillusioned with the business. I had a big plastic bag, garbage bag full of letters from people around the world. And one day I set them on fire in my backyard, my parents' oh. backyard. And it's sad that I burned them all because I had correspondence with, you know, Chris Reifert and, you know, a lot, a lot of famous people. And I, those letters would have been funny as hell right now. It probably would have worked a fortune just to take pictures of them and show them to people. Just the idea of it all. But I burned them all like a dummy. I got pissed off and... And some of these guys I never saw again. Some of them I did, some of them I didn't. But I'm just saying. And then there, and a lot of the guys like that I had correspondence with are rich and famous now, or or more popular than I am. And it's just like, oh yeah, I wish I had some of these letters just to show these dumb these people out there what these guys were saying to me. <laughs> well, you guys had a lot of influence though on a lot of bands, and you know even. Didn't you – you ran into Paul Bostoff, right, who was the original Forbidden drummer. And you guys yeah, – yeah. you actually, even from War Cry, you guys had influenced the name Forbidden with the with the Forbidden Evil tune. Is that is that actually a fact? Yeah, that's true. That's what he told me. So we got the name from you guys just a long time ago. That's you know, cool. I, I, I met a lot of these crazy famous guys, but a lot of them were really cool. He was a nice guy, Paul Bostoff, for sure. Ozzy was really cool. Lemmy was cool every time I met him. Good people. So, yeah, and you guys, like we said, you guys were ahead, you guys were actually ahead of your time. You think of like Funeral Bitch, which you formed in '86, right? That was uh, you, that 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 came out, and that band was what you guys put out. Two how, two, which you put out a release, but it came out again in '91, right? They re-released it, the demo, the fucking death demo. Oh, that was that's Death Strike, the fucking Death. Death Strike, I mean. So that so they re-released. So Death Strike was the fuck demo, and then another one in '91. 
Uh, Funeral Bitch had two demos back in 87, 88, maybe. And Abomination, uh, 88, 89. I was doing a lot of shit at that time. It was ridiculous. And you were doing Funeral Bitch and Abomination at the same time, weren't exactly. you? Basically like 87, I was 80. like cheating on the guys in Funeral Bitch like a bitch at night and playing with Abomination until I finally told them, see you later. But, but yeah, uh, I had a lot of shit going on at that time. I was out of my mind. I was coming up with a lot of ideas and... I wanted to play shows, so I was just out there trying to, to get it together, like I'm still trying all the time to do shows, which we are doing. We're doing lots of shows every year now, but I always wanted to get out and play, and I'm still in that position. I'm trying to get as many tours and shows as I can. Well, Paul, you got so much shit going on, Paul. Like, when we look at your resume, it's like, it's absolutely like, it's pretty crazy, you know? I mean, and you actually got Abomination signed, right? Because you gave a tape. You actually had a tape with you, the what, the red demo tape? And you actually handed it to uh, Joe from the Righteous Pigs? This is true. And he he, uh, he changed my life. He and uh, uh, Mitch Harris told Marcus and, and Slotko from, from Nuclear Blast that they should sign me. And they did. They did a... Uh, <coughs> Excuse me. Did seven releases in in two years, and they made a ton of money off of me. And the label got huge after that. And you, well, you guys, were, you guys were one of the first bands on Nuclear Blast. Is that true too? Wait, what? You, you're one of the Say first again. bands on Nuclear Blast, weren't you? Oh, Macabre was there too. There were some other bands too, but I made a lot of money for Nuclear Blast, and and maybe twelve years ago, Marcus made it correct and sent me a bunch of money. Because wasn't there something going on? They were selling T-shirts for uh, Master and Abomination, like, and you got you weren't getting the cash. Before we even signed, you know, they were already making money before I even signed to the, to the label. My point is, is that, uh, and when you look back at it now, like I said, they made a lot of money, it helped get the label off the ground. But like I said, uh, maybe I think maybe twelve years ago, I was shoveling snow at this very house where I'm sitting in my wow. room right now, and uh, a friend of mine went to kindergarten. With Marcus, and he said to me, Paul, you know, you've been talking shit about my buddy for years, and this is like a good customer of mine, you know, and, and uh, he's buying stuff for me for years, and he's, you know, whatever, and, and he said to me, do you want me to talk to him? I was in kindergarten with him, you know. I said, well, I guess you could, and the craziest thing happened is I got a phone call from the guy a few days later, well, like I said, I was out shoveling snow, and he apologized to me, and he was a millionaire by that 12 years ago, you know that, he's a multi-millionaire now, too, but and he said, Paul, you know, I feel bad about what happened. I talked to my buddy, and he, he talked to you, and maybe we can do something. And so he gave me a publishing deal. He reissued the two Abomination records. He wanted to re, re, reissue Master 2. And he said to me, you know, I'm going to reissue these things, and I'm probably going to lose money. I don't give a shit. I don't need the money. I just want to help you out. And you know what? He helped me out, and he changed my life. And this is why I have my house. It's paid for. My cars are paid for. I have money in the bank. I took the money that he gave me and reinvested it in merchandise over and over and over every year, every tour, over and over shitty record deals, but whatever, in the end, it all paid off everything. And now I'm, I'm really living a good life. That's I don't awesome. have to work. It's only music. I don't have a job. Well, yeah, okay. I have a job. I sell merchandise at the shows that I play, but it's not a bad job. I have to go to the post office, you know, five times a week sometimes, to, to, you know, because the merch I'm selling online, but it could be a worse job. I could have like a real nine to five yeah. job. This is a twenty four hour job, but but I like it. Does that yeah. make sense? Oh, totally. And you know, you mentioned a bomb. And, yeah, that's the key right there. You know, you're doing what you love, and you're going to the post office because you're selling your yes, something sir. that you're making. That's your 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 art. You're not going to you're not going to the post off to drop off boxes for somebody right. else. You know, no, only my that's stuff. The key. Yeah, that's, that's the key. Like and you know, so it's not so bad. You yeah. Know? So you know, and we talk about the abomination deal. So you also got master a deal like a week later, right? Off that sale. Yeah. And you so you, yeah, you guys hadn't jammed for a while. You guys weren't even jamming when you got the deal. Is that correct too? Uh, with, with master. With master. Was, yeah, yeah. Master wasn't jamming, and that was the, that was my point. Is that I got the, the band back together, a few rehearsals, recorded the album, and then the guys became assholes again. And I'm like, fuck it. So I went to Europe with a new lineup with Jim Martinelli from Burnt Offering. On guitar for Master, the Abomination lineup was the same as the record we recorded, and uh, Aaron uh, from Abomination he played on on the Seven Day as well, but he played drums for that tour in 1990 in Europe as well, and that was a big help to go out and play. You know, and the, like I said, the original members of Master they blew it, 
they had a chance to go to Europe and they were dickheads. And I'm like, well, we're going to go without them. See you later. And I never looked back. And here I am, you know, whatever. It's 40 years later. I'm still playing master, having a great time. I'm doing death strike shows. Not lately, but some years back, I did a few abomination shows just for fun to play the old material. They're paying good money for the shows. Like the death strike shows are usually, uh, they call it a money grab. In the sense, it's not really a money grab, in my opinion, because I wrote and sang the song, so I'm singing the song now with it with the same players in whichever band I have at the time, Master. But it's not really a money grab because it's a chance to share the songs with the people. And and for me, I'm having a great time playing the songs as Death Strike, in different versions and not the same as Master. So maybe it's a money grab for some people, but for me, it's a blast to get out there and play this stuff, you know, get more shows, you know. So mm-hmm. I got Death Strike shows, and then I get offered a, a festival with, with uh, you know, some master shows, and the tours are always master. But yeah, I saw you guys already have a bunch of shit ready for next year, even. Huh? I saw you already put up dates for next year, even. Yeah, I got that show, that uh, festival in Chicago there, so one day it's Death Strike and one day it's master. I get a chance to play them both. And what's great about that is my... Uh, my friends and enemies will be there, you know, my friends and enemies. So I get a chance to play in front of a huge crowd, in front of people that hate my guts and that are jealous, and also other people that love me to death. So for me, it's the best of both worlds in a sense, because I'm going to stick it right to them, the ones that hate me and the ones that love That's me. Right. Yeah? That's right. And you yeah, know, you know it. You can have a good time with it. That's how it goes. I mean, as you know, you talk about the 1990 album, um, so, so what was the story with that? So I know, and I even know like you were actually asked to be in the Scott Burns' book that just came out and you did, you want, you want to know part of it. Right. And it all started from that yeah. first record because you guys had dealt with some shit from the label. They weren't happy with basically what you were sending them. Right. And that's pretty much, that was on, the, that's actually happened twice to you, but on the first album, this happened to you in 90, correct? On the debut. Yeah. We recorded the album in, uh, in, uh, Hoffman Estates, Illinois. And, uh, was solid sounds or whatever. And uh, the record company thought it was too heavy, yo. It was dirty and too heavy. It, it was heavy, and it is heavy. That version came out later on later on in my career. I decided I had to release it because it was heavier than the Burns mixes. Now, the problem with Burns, is what, what happened was what he did is he triggered the drums, which is fine. He added some uh, effects to the vocals, which which is also fine. But what, what turned me off about it, there was a... There was uh, some solos in the in the song Terrorizer, and he forgot them. And when I called him, he said, oh, it's too late. Well, that put, a, that put a bad taste in my mouth, yo. I wasn't happy about that. What do you mean it's too late? For me, that just said to me, wow. he's only in it for the money, you know? So it's your record. You really could have fixed that. It's your he record it that cash. your label's paying for, but he didn't put in what you wanted. Interesting. Yeah, he forgot some parts, and I pointed it out to him and he said, Hey dude, uh, it's too late. I'm sorry. Too bad. Wow. So anyway, that, so that's what happened there. Then, uh, when we were recording on the seventh day, um, later on in life or whatever, uh, we had some trouble with the guitar player and whatever. He brought in Paul Masvidal, which is fine. And Paul was really great about it and really friendly with me. We had a good time together. Yeah, I was going to ask you how you got involved with him, how he got wound up on that record. Uh, we, we owned at the Burns. It's fine. I admit that. For instance, that was a good thing he did. He called Paul and Paul came in. And what happened was is Paul, uh, he put the solos on a loop. And I think maybe uh, for 10 hours, he, he, would, he would run the loop for an hour. And then he would record the solo. He recorded all the solos in one day. He flew in from Florida to Florida. He was really great. John Tardy came in and sang some vocals for a six-pack of beer. <laughs> I heard about that. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, this is all really true. But what, what turned me off about Burns at that time, and, and I still remember it, is he was talking shit about uh, about Morbid Angel, for example. He was saying they were difficult to work with and they weren't very good. And and all I thought about was, imagine what he was talking about me when I left. Mm. That was a turnoff for me. And this was the reason why I didn't want to be in the book. You're right. Yeah. Somebody wrote me three or four times in the book, and I just thought, man, if I'm in the book, I'm just going to rip the guy a new asshole because I really didn't like him very much. I know he did some great records, but my records, the drum sound wasn't very good. Yeah, yeah, I heard you were not happy like with the drums on that seventh like, on the seventh day album. I don't like album. the sound about the seventh day, and I 
and the sounds of the first album are okay, but the seventh day is really horrible. And uh, the drummer from Master at that time, Aaron Nikias, he paid extra money to do the triggers. Okay, today it's a modern thing. People do triggers, whatever, as part of your deal, whatever. But back then, he paid extra money to Burns to do the triggers. And then we got the final mixes, and he just hated that album. To this day, he hates that fucking album. And he paid all that money for that work. So we got smoked, and he got smoked. And so I always remember that. Mm. Yes. No, it's, it makes sense. And, you know, you guys, you mentioned the tour earlier, the 90 tour with uh, – with Pugnant Stench and Abomination. So you got, so you were opening with Abomination, Pugnant Stench in the middle, and then Master on top, correct? For 26 shows. 26 shows. Is it true that uh, Alex Wank was actually annoyed that Aaron was hitting the drums too hard? Like he was – because were you guys sharing kits on that on that tour? Yeah, he was, he, he was just – Aaron was just destroying the drums. And in the end, we would find out years later that we bought that drum set. We bought the ass. We bought all that shit. We got ripped off on that tour. We didn't make a lot of money. We played 26 shows times two, me and Aaron. And I think we walked away with maybe $1,000 $1, each or something. We got ripped off. Wow. We bought all their gear. I didn't know about it until years later. Okay, it's water under the bridge. You know, I've seen uh, I've seen Martin. We still play, uh, you know, Shrink. Uh, plays a bunch of stands. We've done some festivals together. We get all along really well. This is a long time ago. It's water under the bridge, believe me. Nice. <laughs> but we got smoked on that tour, yeah. And uh, Alex was pissed off because Aaron was just blow beating the shit out of his kit, yo. Even though we bought the kit, he was destroying <laughs> it, smashing the symbols of hell and stuff. It was great. Aaron was an animal. We had a lot of fun on that tour. The guys were all uh, vegetarians and vegans, and and uh, you know we were driving around in these two vans. So, like in Europe, it's not so cold. In 1990, now. how do you find those restaurants too? I mean. It's, well, in 1990, we were driving around these two uh, Volkswagen vans, and there was no heat in them, or little heat, and it was freezing. Now it's not so cold in Europe anymore. I don't know. I don't want to say global warming. I don't know what it is, but it's not so cold anymore where I'm at now. But back then, it was cold, and we all had to huddle in the vans together, the four guys or the five guys, and we were like holding each other to stay warm. But we had some fun times with Punch and because we couldn't find restaurants in the middle of the night and the guys in my band wanted to beat those guys up because they wanted to eat and, but back then you couldn't find vegetarian and vegan restaurants right. today now they're everywhere in the world yeah it's a, that's every a city time every village but not in 1990 exactly it's very difficult oh so we had a lot of great memories a lot of fun believe me it yeah. wasn't all bad a lot of a lot of funny stuff i remember you know so as we mentioned, ninety one Death Strike, you put out the fucking Death. Um, well, they they put out what? So that was it had eight tracks this time, right? It had the original four from the demo on there. And then the four from ninety one, which everybody hated. Everybody hated the four from ninety one. The problem with the four from ninety one is we went to the same studio, and where I was living with my friend, um, she didn't tell me that the guy called from the studio and said that uh, he had to go to a funeral. I was screaming at the guy because we had the studio booked, and so we ended up going somewhere else because I screamed at him, which was a mistake. And obviously, we couldn't capture the sound. And, and besides, how are you going to capture the sound from 1985 to 1991 anyway with different players? It's just it's not going to happen. That's the thing I always say about albums. You know, people ask me, what's your favorite album? I always have to tell them there is no favorite. Everyone is a different time and space in your life, a different time in the world. The lyrics uh, vary on what's happening in the world here and there at that time, but you can't recreate what you did fucking 30 years ago. Your voice isn't the same. Your mind isn't the same. Technology isn't the same. The world is no longer the same. How can I go back and do the album again? I know some people, people do it, but I'm not interested in that. I'm going to leave what happened back then where, where it is, you know? I definitely, yeah. And you actually, so, and I know, so next you guys did 91, you also did the Tragedy Strikes record, which you actually produced because you were not satisfied with the first Abomination record, the production on that. Is that also? A lot of people like that one, but I thought the, I thought Tragedy Strikes was better for me. It was more crunchy. You know, people were calling it like uh, Speckman meets Metallica. That wasn't the point. It was just more crunchy. I think it had a more uh, better production, you know, the same studio, everything. Just I stepped in and said, I want it like this. And, I thought that record was a good record. It only sold like 25,000 copies, but back then that was still okay. You know? yeah, definitely. 
um, and I actually so, so ninety three. You guys put out Master put out the collective of uh, collection of Souls record, which I actually thought that was like definitely had more of a, like a punk and a thrash feel to it, right? Than some of the previous stuff. Um, yeah. What do you remember? The, what do you remember about the label? The, well, the, the label hated, uh, hated the record because it didn't sound like on the seventh day. They spent the same amount of money, but we didn't trigger the drums, and we, you know, it, it was not as heavily produced, right? Yeah. It, we went back to that uh, solid sound again where we did the first master uh, record, the original one that they didn't like. We went there again. And I thought it was way heavy. I thought it was a heavy record. Definitely. I like that record. Definitely like more of a punk. Of seven day, you know? Yeah, it definitely had more of a punk. I know. I, I'm seven, I just want to say, I know On the Seventh Day is my big hit record or whatever, but not for me, you know? Everything after that record for me is better. Well, I heard you make a statement, which I actually heard, and I actually agreed with, um... Cause I, and I, I wait, thought about on, it after I heard you say it. You had said when you first started doing like the first couple master records, the musicians that you had later on were so much. And this was we're just, you know, the musicians today are, you know, it was much more. Uh, how would you put it? Just better musicians. Right. Eventually you wound up getting in the band. Yeah. As time as time yeah. went on, so when you look back at the yeah. old records, you're hearing the musicians on the new records, and you're it's it's probably hard, it's. I heard you say this, and I actually totally was like, you know, I know exactly what he's saying. Like, I'll let you explain it, but if you understand what I'm trying to say, I understand that the musicians are better today. That's all there is to it, yo. We we did what we did back then, but uh, you don't want to have the same solos and the same feeling. Everything twenty five years later. You got to move on with your music. You got to evolve, yo. Okay, maybe people don't like what they, they may, everybody wants to hear on the seventh day, but the point is, is that I think the newer records have evolved. They're much better, yo. I play better. The the musicians play better. The riffs that I write are much better. They're they're more technical. I'm not saying they're you know, it's not tech metal, but they're more technical from the versus the early albums where I was just playing E all the time, you know. I play a little bit more notes now, which is better. And I, I think it's better. And so it's I think it's really sad for a lot of people that they haven't heard the last 10 albums. The last 10 albums are way better than On the Seventh Day. Yeah, it's a catchy album. It's got some cool stuff. But the, the later records are better. We play better. I sing better. In my opinion, it's just better stuff. Like, for example, this brand new song, I think it's way better than the, than, than the stuff from way back. Technology is better in some ways, and the production is better. I think it's got a great, crispy new sound. It still sounds like Master, but it's it's new. I, it's hard to explain. Oh, man, it makes that total sense. Um, and Collection of Souls was actually your last – was that the last release on Nuclear Blast, right? You you pretty much moved on after that from um... – Oh, they, they, they didn't want to work anymore with me. They didn't like that record, even though like, when you called the – Paul Nuclear Blast, it was on their answer machine for more than a year, but for some reason they didn't like that record. But it doesn't matter. Whatever. And you moved out to Hollywood after that. Um, uh, yeah. How Hollywood, was that experience? Yeah. I've been I've been out there. I, it's a, definitely a, a different world, right? I could never get a band together. I tried for two years. And you would think that would be the opposite, right? Everyone thinks Hollywood or L.A., you're going to... Yeah, you're going to find a musician there for sure. Yeah, I found some great musicians, but they were on heroin, you know. It was like I would I would teach them the songs, and we'd sound really great. And I'd leave, I, I'd go back to Arizona to visit my old girlfriend or whatever for like ten days or whatever. I come back to Hollywood, and they couldn't remember how to play the songs anymore. We only had three of them, <laughs> and so this went on for like uh, more than almost two years, more than a year. Let's say a year and a half, and then I moved back to Arizona, put together a lineup in Arizona, did Faith Is in Season. That was a struggle, but it got me to Europe. I was about to say that was a huge thing for you, though, right? Because it. Yeah, then I moved to Europe and I never came back. And I've been in Europe, you know, I've been here for 23 years now. You know? Because you did that tour with uh, Malevolent Creation, uh, Crabathor, which you would actually wind up in the band. Um, Yeah. And Malevolent, you know, we're, we're, obviously, we all, we all love Malevolent. Um, And you actually. I love Malevolent. I love Phil, you And you, and you spoke to Brett. Couple of days before he passed, didn't you? Yeah, I, I loved Brett. You know, he was a great guy. Awesome, he told man. me he was going to be all right. He said, "I'm feeling better. I'm going to be all right." And then he died. I was sad. You know, yeah. that hit me like a, sh- a shot in the shot in the heart, man. Yeah, we saw them the last uh, time we saw them. They were he was amazing. At what? I'm sorry. Go ahead. 
Oh, go ahead. What were you saying? Oh, I was just saying, me, we had played with Brett, right? Ed, what year was that? 2016 was that? And he, yeah, was, he was – it was it was awesome, man. That was the last time I saw him play live. I mean – Yeah, he, he came out here. They were on a European tour, and and uh, oh, they had some trouble, I remember. But the bass player ran away with all the money. They had some British bass player. They made tons of money, and he ran away with the money and left the equipment in a ditch somewhere. Oh, my God. Glove and Creation always had a lot of problems over the years, dude. But I love the guys. I still love Phil. I'm glad that things are – starting to happen again. Yeah, you're never going to replace Brett. But you can't blame the guy for trying to get back out yeah. there and doing it. Definitely. You know? Definitely. I, I understand why he's trying to do it, man. There's nothing like going out and playing your music. Even with a different lineup. Well, and they I have a totally vast cat- catalog, so he deserves so all that stuff. Yeah, man. Come on, he wrote a lot of that stuff. So I'm glad that he's out there trying again. He's coming back out to Europe next year, I just read. Good for him. I'm happy. He's doing South America at the same time as we are, so maybe we'll hook up for a few shows. I hope. We'll see. You know? Nice, nice. But yeah, Brett, Brett was – it was sad when we lost Brett, man. He was a great guy. Funny guy, great guy. I remember him and I, like, in uh, on that tour in 99 in Europe, <laughs> competing for girls and stuff. It was great, you know? Me and Brett, there'd be some – a hot chick at the club, and we'd both be trying to get her, you know? And sometimes he'd beat me, you know? Sometimes I'd beat him, but we would laugh about it the next day when we're on our way somewhere else. You know that. These are some of the memories I'll never forget. That's why we became so close, because we had so much fun together, you know? We, were, we did 44 shows together on an old school bus with no bathrooms, no toilets. Oh. We, were, we had urine bombs rolling around in the morning. He's big uh Two, two uh, liter bottles filled with piss in the morning. We have to empty them, of course. <laughs> They're rolling around the bus, and the bus was so shitty. Like uh, they, they were, it was like the beds had these slats, you know, like these rows of slats. And sometimes you'd fall on the guy below you. They were three high, and they were so shitty. You did a movement in your sleep. All of a sudden, you would crash down on the oh. next guy, and maybe the next guy under him. It was really shitty, but great memories, you know. We started fires, bonfires. We'd, just crazy stuff. 44 days, and in, in, I think we had 44 shows in 49 days. It was crazy. Great memory. Yeah, Brett was a great front man, too, definitely. Um, oh, man. Of course. Yeah. It, the great. Yeah, he was a great front man. And you actually, I wanted to ask you about, what was the, the Solutions album you did? And what was it, 99? That was like your, that was like the, right the punk record, right? It was a punk record. Just a punk record. I've, I've always liked, uh, I said before, Discharge, GBA, She Exploited, MDC, Minor Threat. I love this stuff. So uh, I wrote a bunch of punk songs, and the guitar player, Brian, wrote a couple of punk songs. And So right after this tour with them guys, we stayed in uh, the UK, uh, not the UK, in Holland for like two weeks and went in the studio, and we uh, rehearsed like twice, and we went in the studio and recorded, mixed, and mastered the whole album in 16 hours. And it's a great punk record. It's got some really cool stuff. We used like an all-star lineup of famous Dutch guys in the metal scene at that time, and it came out really good for sixteen hours. You know, uh, sixty, yeah, definitely. Um, and you was so, with, and then you obviously so Crabathor. Can you tell us? I know like their their basis the singer left. And if can you tell us how you got involved with them, and you actually, when you were, I, I wanted to ask you, you were going back and forth, right? You were going from Czech back to was it Arizona? Back, you were doing yeah, shows in Czech. Going back to Arizona, yeah, working and doing shows? Go back and, and then I would work like uh, the fall in, into the spring, moving furniture in Arizona. And I actually took Christopher, a guitar player, with me at Skull one time, too. So they were all moving furniture. I was the boss and the driver. And, and then we would go back and, and tour uh, Europe in the in the summer. We did that for a couple summers. And uh, then the guitar player, he decided he wanted to stay in America. And I, I met my girlfriend at the time and said, you know, I'm going to stay in check. So we kind of traded places like that movie of Eddie Murphy, Trading Places. Great movie. We're good. Yeah. yeah. And your first, when you first got the check, you said it was, it was pretty crazy, right? Because you were kind of like the first couple of months, everybody knew who you were. You were kind of getting the whole, that's a treatment, right? It was a pretty much a big party yeah, at first. Drunk all the time, you know? Drunk all the time. <laughs> Everywhere you go, they recognize you and buy you a beer. 
And 20 <laughs> beers later, you're falling down, crawling home, you know? And this is good beer, you know, too. It's totally different than the States beer. Probably, probably six months. So I finally got a hold of myself, you know? Came to grips with reality. That was a hard time. But whatever. I'm glad I went through that because life is great now. I've been here for 23 years. I got my house. Like I told you, we're sitting in my my room here and just relaxing. Wife's in the other room, whatever. Watch the TV. Yeah, so you, you moved. So I obviously I've done the same. I, I'm over in Eastern Europe now. We go back and forth. Um, it's just different, right? It's I, I think people don't re- – I didn't realize until I came over here. Like my wife is – my wife's a child surgeon here. So we go back and, you know, we're back and forth. But okay. living in the States, I think you always have this idea – you don't realize until you go somewhere else what it's like. Like, like here, I always tell this to Ed. Like, we don't have police chasing us around here. We don't have cops hiding behind bridges trying to pull us over. No, we don't have any no of this shit. Like, kids can walk freely through the neighborhoods. Like, I have two young daughters. You don't. Of course, you got to be just with human nature. You got to be careful. But Yo, it's just a totally different be, world. You don't have to be terrified. Yeah, I mean, and you notice this too. I was going to ask you what's. Obviously. Obviously, there's lunatics everywhere. But the point is, you're right. It's safe here. You can leave the door open. You can leave the door unlocked. Nobody's going to break in. Okay, we lock the door. But, you know, not always. Sometimes I don't. I go to bed and the door's still unlocked. So what? You know, and as you said, um, the, the only time the police ever come over to my house was like maybe five years ago to ask me if and check if uh, somebody was trying to open my back door because somebody was stealing shit in the neighborhood's backyards, like in the neighbor's backyards and Never happened. But you're right. The police don't bother me. They don't pull me over. I've been pulled over one time, knock on wood, but one time in 23 years to look at my license, only once. And in America, I got pulled over a million times when I lived there. Yeah, it's so different. I'm not, I'm not anti-American at all. I love America. Same here. Yeah, my daughter's 17 and just started driving, and she works at Chipotle. And, uh, like, last night she was coming home, and I looked because we had a little – family app that we track each other and i noticed she stopped at a 7-eleven at at 10 30 at night and i'm like i told my wife no nope i said she cannot if she needs gas she's got to do it during the daytime because all it takes is is she's only 5'1 and about 90 pounds she'll she'll be taken in a second or or her car will be taken i'm like we can't have it and i hate that that's what I mean. Exactly. Uh, here you don't even I'm, think about I'm, that. I'm watching this stuff on the news all the time in America, and I'm just shocked how bad it's getting no. over there. Yeah, it's... it's not the same here. You just said it. It's not the same. The police aren't following me. You know, you still think that. Like, for example, <laughs> I'll, I'll say that. Even last week, you know, I get in my car, you know, and I'm driving to the rehearsal studio, and all of a sudden a police car pulls out, yeah, behind me, and you're in a panic for a second. And then I remember, uh, Paul, you, you you're, you're you're in the Czech Republic. I do the and same honestly, thing, dude. I'm, down, I'm just driving, and you know what? The next two blocks later, the cop turns right. He's going somewhere else, maybe for donuts. Yeah, he's not bothering me. I'm smiling. I'm like, Jesus, wake up, Paul. It's not the same mentality. I keep driving where I'm going. You're 100 percent right. Because when I'm driving with my wife, I'm always like, oh, there's a cop, and she's like, it's not like that here, Tony. She's like, you don't have to think like that. <laughs> like in Florida, yeah. I'm like, oh shit, like what's gonna happen? You know, what are they gonna try to pull? Oh yeah. Um, but, gotcha. It's true. But yeah, you know, I know, and I, I know you've been there for a while, and I, I've heard you say like, yeah, you play for for you. You get to go to the states on tour, so you get to visit, you know. You, but you get to live. Yeah. It's like, I mean, besides the winter, I mean, the winter's pretty rough here. But besides the winter, I mean, it's Europe's a whole different world. And I think until people actually live there and realize, because we have this misconception of like, I feel pretty free here, man. You know, I mean, it's. I do too. Yeah, it's it's one of those things, you know. I mean, uh, I, I will say, you know, Blackowitz, uh he was nuts when he was over here all the time, 11 creation. He was like, you know, I love the guy. Don't get me wrong. You know, he's had a lot of problems. I still love the guy. I still write him. But just saying, just a Florida guy, Blackowitz, you know, or whatever, transplant. I know he's from New York. But uh, he uh, was like totally pro-Bush and stuff back in the day when we were on that tour, you know, and uh, – he was like he was like beating people up about Bush, you know, getting in fistfights and shit. I was just shocked about it. I didn't say anything. I just let it go because I'd already been living in Czech and I was like, man, you know, and then and, and I will say one strange thing about Love and Creation back then is they brought like fucking huge duffel bags like Santa Claus of fucking American food 
in packages, microwavable dinners, and they had like two bags of it. And I'd be over there eating fucking schnitzel and mashed potatoes and just in heaven eating great food, you know, or beef stroganoff or some really good stuff. And the guys would be in the bus putting in microwave dinners. They hated the European wow. food. I'll never get over that. That's, you know, the beer and the food are good I, here. Though. I mean, of course you can get some little sides. I love Phil. Don't get me wrong. But back then in 99, they had some strange ideas about stuff. I'm sure it changed maybe later on in life. Maybe they were young, but they hated the European food, and the European food is fucking fantastic. I love it. I mean, and if you want to get American food here, it's, like, ridiculous. Like, they have, like, you can get their shops with it, but you're going to pay, like, for a bottle of ketchup from the States, you're paying, like, three times what you'd pay at a store there. So it's, you know, I mean. The food there, there's no preservatives. not 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 working. I mean, I'm not anti-American. Oh, you already know that. I'm not anti-American at all. The same here, yep. Okay, I just found a lot more freedom here. The food is great here. The fruit is great in America. The too. beer is great you know, I here. So I had to adapt, you know, and I did, and I'm happy. You know? Yeah, yeah exactly. No, exactly. I it's totally get it. America, believe me. I, okay. I totally get it. Um, so you, so you did, so with Crab Thor, you did two records, right? You did the 2000, 2003. What was the reason that? They hated, they hated them. The Czechs and the Slovaks hated them. I heard you say that People before. People around so. the world, people around the world love the records. Germans, they love them. They like the idea that it was a taste of Speckman with Kravathor. But over here in Czech and Slovakia, they hated my records with them. Whatever, I don't care. I did my best. You know, I was into it at the time. I liked the record. And you guys did like four it. years of festivals, right, and shows. So you had a good time with yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, and, and the, the the festivals were still huge with me. Okay, they're. In the end, you know, everybody wanted the Bruno, the bass player, back. I don't care, whatever. He and I are still friends, you know. I don't care, you know. It didn't work, but you know what? Krabathor made my life change because I stayed here forever. So even if the band didn't work out in the end with the people, my life sure did. And not only that, but yeah. you also got a new lineup for Master right out of that. You got an EP out of, and a full length out of that Ross, out of uh, the Krabathor exactly. guys. Yeah, so in the end, it worked out for me. Because uh, you guys did what? You guys did the Follow Your Savior EP in 2001 and then the Let's Start a War in 2002. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you know. What was the and deal then, with the 85 unreleased album? Say it again? The, the 85 unreleased album that came out, what, in 2003? That was So that was shelved at one time? Yeah, that was, that was the original demos, you know? That was the demos we did that uh, went around the world. Like we did the Death Strike demos, we did the Master demos. That was the original demos before the recording in 89. Those were done in 85. So I had to release those eventually to let people hear what all the all the noise was about in the cassettes and stuff, you know, in the tape training days. I said better to put out a proper version of it, you know. Uh, definitely. Um an, an album which I think definitely kind of reflect. Did, no, did this have something to do with you, which you're actually moving? So in 2004, Master would put out the Spirit of the West album. Um, yeah. So, so was there a lot of influence in that writing with your move at that time period? Yeah, sure. yeah, exactly. That's when I was making, really making my move over here and for good, kind of like, you know. So, and obviously, you know, Johnny Cash just died. And all of a sudden, I got this idea. Let's do a cash cover and let's kind of make a Spirit of the West album. And so there's only a couple songs on there, really, that are the Spirit of the West and the cover, you know. I think maybe three songs, you know. And the rest of it's like normal, anti-government, anti-everything, you know, like normal. So but that... I just use, yeah, the, the, the record company said, oh, that's a great concept. You know, come, come to Germany. There's a a fake German town in Germany. We could take pictures there. And he got all excited. And I went with it. I was going to ask you about the album cover. Whose idea was that? Yeah, we did the whole layout there. And it was a good time. And you know? was there, a, now that band that you put together for that record, was there, there was a big language barrier there, right? Yeah, yeah. Nobody spoke English at all. Now, how great. was that at first? You know, you know like, like Joe Perry said, let the music do the talking. That was the truth. You know, the first two days I went to the rehearsal studio and uh, my wife did, uh, you know, obviously is Czech, and she did translations. And finally she got fed up with it and left. And so I just had to, I would take the guitar and show him the riff, give it back to him, play the bass. And I would nod to the drummer, and he would come up with three or four different beats, and I would pick one. And that's how we put that album together. 
It was really difficult. It took a couple months. But in the studio, it was fine. And then as the years went by, the, the drummer learned English from all the tours we were doing. We kept doing a lot of tours with American bands and, and other bands, you know, from the UK and even other European bands. They all speak English, obviously. Speak English or die. That was really true. And he learned English, so it made things easier. The, the guitar player who came back to the band two years ago, he still doesn't speak much English, but it doesn't matter. He speaks enough now, and obviously it's simple. To, we, we were together for 16 years before I split up for a few years. And obviously after 16 years, you know how to work with each other. Yeah, I was going to ask you about it. Well, the guitar and, you know, I still do it the same way I did then, except now we can talk a little bit more, you know. And was you probably, when you guys did the uh, Four More Years of Terror album, it was probably a lot, of, it was probably, the communication was a little easier then, right? Because... I yeah, mean, sure. Every couple of years, it got better and better, you know that. Because that that I always thought I thought that the four more uh, years of terror was a is an underrated record. That was a heavy ass record right there. Yeah, um, the only problem with it is it was too long, you know. It was an hour. <laughs> yeah, people's attention spans, especially especially now, right? I mean, we talk about so we can actually ask Paul about this, Ed, because we talk about this all the fucking time on this show. I think a record, a new record has like two weeks where people actually listen and then they fade out. And if you do anything longer than 30 minutes, it's like they just seem yeah, to just drift. Younger. Yeah, exactly. And actually, I, I was smiling about it because uh, the guitar player said something to me recently. You know, back in the day, records were only 29 or 30 minutes. This and he true. said to me, it's enough. Rain and and maybe blood. he's right. Maybe he's right. I don't know. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. I think maybe he's right about it. That uh, people lose, uh, they 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 lose concentration after thirty minutes. It's enough. Yeah, and, and, and maybe you're right. And, I, and we're like what we're saying with the two week thing. It just seems like I'm not even going to mention the bands, but bands that we love, they come out and the album is for two weeks. It's everywhere. It's like shoved down your throat. It's and then after that, it's I don't know what happens. It's it just great. goes away. Yeah, it's not like the old days. No, nah, you know it's um it's just a yeah, it's, it's a weird thing. thing. Like, people just aren't. Metalheads aren't what they were 20 years ago, yo. No, back I mean, in the day, back in the day, it was a different scene. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, and you There's probably so see it with the cell phones. Too much shit on the internet. Well, we used to go to record stores. At once, yo. Back in the day, you know, when Slayer was putting out Rain and Blood or Hell Awaits and Metallica, Kill 'Em All, Ride the Lightning. Those were the days, yo. Everybody had a better attention span. There wasn't so much to choose from, yo. Like when you now play the, shows now, is like everybody on their phones? Like do you see when people when you play shows now, it, it, does it drive you crazy when you just like how much of a the crowd is on their phones now? I see it all the time when I'm at shows. Well, not not those shows last weekend. See, that's not nice, because they man. don't get good shows. They don't get good shows, so they're watching, jumping up and down like crazy idiots because they're they're not saturated yet. But yeah, that's a problem like in Europe nowadays too, and you know it. There's a show every week. Yeah. Sometimes it shows on the same day. Or it's the competition is fierce. It was better twenty years ago. Yeah, no, I, and you're I, right. It was better without cell phones. I agree. Yeah, cell phones suck. I mean, you, you know, you see the bands playing, and you have to think to yourself, how does like, you know, I know as a local band guy, like it drives me crazy. When people are on their phones. I could just imagine if you're like, you know, playing, and everyone's got their cell. There's one thing that. Even as like the guy standing there watching, there's a bunch of cell phones in your face when they're filming the bands play. But I could imagine being, you know, when you're actually up there playing and, the, and people are texting in the front of the fucking crowd, you know. Or they're yawning. Yeah, <laughs> yawning. I hate that too. You always see some chick out there and you're like, man, the fuck I'm working my ass off up here. The <laughs> chick's just yawning. You're saying to yourself, what the fuck, you know? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I get you. True. So, to, so to, uh, 2007 now, you guys put out the uh, Slaves to Society record. And the title and the yeah. artwork, I thought, you know, are, are, are very cool because – so the statement you guys are basically saying, right, was that the society the, – basically the women are the slaves and the devil is society fucking them basically, right? It's just like one of those things where it's – You know, we're all slaves to society, you know. Uh, and also double entendre or whatever, you know, you're – you're working for the man. You're a slave to society as well. Both, you know, two meetings. That was a great record. And great record. Yeah. I still love that record. And what's crazy about that, again, many people don't even know about that record. That's a good record. There's a lot of cool tracks on that record I wrote. Yeah. Know? And the lyrics, I think the lyrics are great in that record. And when you write, so when you write your lyrics, right, you pretty much write 
it's like a journal to you, right? It's not like you don't, you know, you don't write what everybody else writes. Like, you know, when it comes to the death metal, like, you know, the, you don't really have those kind of lyrics. It's, it's political or it's basically like a journal of what you've seen. Is that correct too? Yeah. I mean, once in a while, I put once in a while, like any band, I put in fucking fiction, you know, fantasy. Yeah. I song about a murderer, but not all the time. Once in a while, you know, once in a while I run out of ideas and I'm like, oh, maybe it's time to write a song about some murderer or whatever. But the, not all the time, but you're right. I try, it's like a journal of my life and what was going on at a particular time in the world from my eyes, you know. And I always tell the people, I'm not right or wrong, you know. Maybe sometimes I'm right, maybe sometimes I'm wrong. This is just my opinion of something. doesn't mean it's right or wrong. Everybody has an opinion. And I just like to share my opinions through my music, and I think that's the way to go. But on the other hand, I have nothing, no, nothing against gore metal and violent metal and you're singing about you know killing each other every day. that's great too you know whatever i don't have a problem with that just i have a different way of writing and i always have and maybe that's the reason why i'm not so famous maybe i didn't push the push the the bill hard enough i don't know but i'm still fighting on anyway always <laughs> exactly yeah you know, well you guys 40 I, years you know, come on 40, 40 years 40 years and actually playing concert in 40 years you know, 40 years i mean you know and and you actually kept the lineup I know Alex came back in 2022, but you pretty much kept that lineup for those albums 16 for 16 years. years together. Yeah, that was the longest lineup we ever had. The guys quit because they wanted more money. To be quite honest with you, they found out about a show where I was a Death Strike show where I was getting a bigger amount of the pie, and and I was still paying them the same money, and they thought they deserved more. And I told them, "Fuck you," and and they quit. Because because a lot of times, like, uh, I was getting a certain amount of money for one show, and I'd give the guys a good cut. And once in a while, I'd get a show for more money, which would pay me back for all the fucking cuts that I took, let's say, six months ago. And in my opinion, that works. You get this amount of money every day for these shows, and I take a little cut because the tour wasn't so good. And then later on, I get a better show for more money. I'm going to take a little bit more of that for myself. And I thought that was a fair deal. They didn't understand it. It's because it's a Czech mentality, a Slovak mentality. They're always never getting enough. Doesn't matter. So they quit. I put together the U.S. lineup. Uh, we did a European tour, U.S. tour. We did uh, Mexico and Central America. COVID came in and fucked everything up. The guys didn't want to get the shots. They couldn't travel, so they stayed in America. I stayed here. Two years of hell, and then Alex came back. And, a, and a, another drummer came back from 12 years ago, and we've been playing ever since really busy again. So it, it worked out, but... You know. how, how was the check? So I know here it was really like... I was I always tell Ed, because I was over here when it first came. You know, actually, I remember getting in an airport in Tampa and seeing the news, and I started seeing... I, I started seeing Chinese people with masks on walking around in the airport more, and I started seeing the news, and I said, huh, I didn't think anything of it, really, to be honest. Like... And then right when I got back to Europe, boom. And it was, I mean, you couldn't, they were sending drones by people's <laughs> windows to make sure there wasn't parties going on. Okay, so check it out. So so with what you're saying, so I uh, I came back from uh, the USA, from Florida. I landed in uh, Vienna at about maybe 10 o'clock at night. There were some people inside the airport, not a whole lot, but some people grabbing their bags and leaving and stuff. And then... Uh, Maybe I waited for my bags. I finally got my guitar and stuff, and I got a card, and I said, okay, it's time to go outside and have a cigarette. You know, and so I go outside, and I light a cigarette, and now the entire airport is empty outside. There's not, not a soul out there. I wait for my brother-in-law to pick me up. It's like a science fiction movie. One guy comes out with an orange uh, vest, and he's cleaning up cigarette butts and trash. It's only me and him outside. And the next day, the entire European world was on lockdown. I came home just in time. Then, uh, like, within a week, you had to have papers to travel. They had fucking borders with police and army two kilometers from my house. I'm driving over there, and they put up the, the stop thing, you know, the little red, red thing stop. And thankfully, I had the papers to get out. But they want to see your driver's license, all your shit. The guy's got a machine gun. That's two kilometers like from a movie. my house. Yeah, it was like a science fiction movie. I couldn't believe it. So I understand. Yeah, here they had super. like it was only allowed to have like four people in a store. I'm I'm talking big stores too. Like they would be lined up. It was like it was like Soylent Green or something. It was absolutely. Yeah. It was it was pretty intense. Right time, right? I'm yeah, glad I mean, it went away. 
Yeah, and I one thing that I one thing I like that I had heard you say because I, I actually agree with this, and nothing against the bands that did it at all, but I, I didn't like all the live streams and stuff like that. Like, and I know you wanted uh, no part of that, right? Well, hey, no, I said no to ask me a few times. No, no live stream. I'll play when we can, you know. And yeah. two years later, we could. Yeah, the one thing I will say about the two years at home is I made a ton of money. You know, everybody was buying merch online because they were at home. It's true. Yeah, you know, no one's spending money at the clubs. Sometimes three, three days a week. I mean, it was ridiculous. For two years. Two years, I had money in the bank all the time. My PayPal just kept growing. I kept, you know, like buying things, having a good time. But I, obviously, that was fine. But I would rather play. You know that. Yeah, well, you're also – another cool thing that I think that you do do is we, we do live in an era where – everyone's trading files and they're recording at home and you have everybody's doing home studios. Oh, right. I know how this, you with mastered, you will not, which I, I think it's awesome. You do not want to do no, I don't record in the home studio. I go to the studio. Yeah. You are. Yeah. You have to go to a studio for me to get the feeling. I, I don't get the feeling at home. Yo. I, you know, I know you can scream in a microphone in your computer, but I want to go to the studio, man. I want to get away from the house. I want to go, go into that studio environment and, Try and get a sound on the bass, and oh, it sounds like shit. I can't do it again. Or arrangements, right? Because I mean, I, like when you're in yeah. a studio jamming together, you can change. It's not like you don't have to email the guy to say, "Let's change this and change this." You have this. Uh, uh, it's like just a different magic, different vibe. Yeah, we were rehearsing in the basement in the studio. Thankfully, the guitar player Alex, his, his brother, owns the studio, and we have our uh, rehearsal studio in the basement in a crappy room in the basement, and we practice there. You know. And so when it's time to record a studio, we got it easy. Yeah, we moved the shit upstairs. You know, that's great. But I got to do it in the studio. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure how you get the same feeling at home. Yeah, I know. It's I, different I, today. I don't know. I mean, to each his own. But I, I prefer to record in a real studio, and I always will. I'm never going to record my record at home. I, I don't think it's fair. You know, you, you got to put added effort in the studio, man. You, you know. It's just not like a computer and going up, blah, 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 you know, at home. You know, I don't want to do that. Yeah, I do. that's my opinion. I mean, teach his own again. I don't like to be like a dictator because I'm not. Do it your own way. But for me personally, the studio is the way. Yeah, and you. So you know, I I agree with you. I uh, there's just like we when we talk about it all the time. Me and Ed, even it's like there is just something about you know you get together a couple nights a week and you kind of like we said you can format shit like let's add this here, take this out here. You know, yeah. it's just a more natural environment. Um, but you do do studio projects because you've been doing so. So you've been doing uh, Johan, what is it, Johansson and Speckman, which is Raga, which we know Raga Ed. Um, you've been so you've done what six albums together? Yeah, the last one is the best one. You know, the last one is the most natural one actually. Now with him, uh, I just write the vocals and go to the studio and sing them. But again, you know. This is the point. He, he does the stuff in Sweden and sends it to me, but I still go to the studio to do the vocals because otherwise I'm not going to get the live feeling, you know? So I will say that, that with him, that's how we do it. He sends me the shit. I go to the studio. He puts it in the PA, and I sing the songs and record. I still have to go to the studio. I know that he does stuff at home. That's his thing. But for Master, everything is in the studio. It's just for me, that's the way, you know? And you guys have something, you guys working on something new or is it? Uh... Oh, we did a new album that came out in Mexico a month ago. And nobody knows about it. And it's the best one of the six. It's the best one. It's the last one. We're finished. There's no more. I don't want to do it anymore. But it's. A, but I will say it's a great record. It's called Beneath the Bleeding Sky. It's an excellent record. It's the best one. But unfortunately, nobody's going to hear it because it's Mexican label. Um, they, they don't know what they're doing, you know. And Paul, you've dealt with a label that we've dealt with, and actually, I'm glad you mentioned that. So, which one? <laughs> Metal one Bastard I, Records. I just want to say really quick, it's called Metalized Records in Mexico. In case somebody's looking for the record, now go ahead. What are you saying? Which Metal, label? Metal Bastard Records. Oh yeah, shit. That guy's a creep, yo. Oh man. So you guys, yeah. I remember when Mitch Harris put out a thing because he was putting out defecation shit without permission. So we had. I'll just put it like real. this. It was, it was phony. Yeah, yeah. Me and Ed put out a couple records through that company, and no liner notes, man. Not, not like I'm talking like we would get. Oh, the paper, the paper was cheap too. <laughs> Do we? Like, 
So like really, really cheap recycled paper, you know? Dude, we put out an yeah. album and we didn't get it out. So the out al- we had I had to buy it off of uh, Amazon. Like for a year I didn't get it when it came out. Uh it was just uh I'm not even gonna mention the guy's name. We both know it, I'm sure, who runs the but like yeah, yeah, I don't talk to him anymore. He's still offering me money all the time, yeah. He's off he's the guy is so rich that he's offered me great money to record records, but I won't do it. You know? Man, he yeah we he's offered me like uh, he's offering like ten thousand euros to record a new death strike in cash. Damn. But I told him no way. I can't do it. I signed this I signed my new contract with Hammerheart and they're basically my boss for the next nine years and it's fine. They're doing great work. Yeah. Everything is okay with that. That guy had- was a freak. But what I wanted to say was at the point in time with that guy, I just wanted to get something out. This is the reason why I released some of these records with that guy because he would send me the product and I would sell it and I would make money. I'll tell you the truth, you know? No, we but did it because we just wanted to get our name out there. I mean, at that time. Period. Yeah, well, so, I mean, I, I made some money selling all the shit he sent me. I'll give you that. But the products were total crap. I agree with you. He He's sent like, us a CD, Paul. Oh, he with... would spell words of songs and shit. <laughs> He's... I, I, you know, the back of the record is like, uh, he misspelled a word. I'm like, what the fuck, dude? You misspelled the word of the song. Like, I don't care. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. We had gotten CDs where we sent them. Like we had the whole layout we sent in, and I'm talking that there's not you wouldn't even know who's in the band. It's a white. You open up the CD, and there's not one line or note, nothing, man. It was it was insane. Yeah. But I saw you dealt with that Ollie. too, and I was like, Oh yeah, yeah. I don't deal with him anymore. He still writes to me every six months to a year. I give you ten thousand for a new Death Strike record, and I just I don't answer him anymore. Yeah, I know he'll give me the money, but I don't answer him anymore. Yeah, I don't want to deal with the guy. You know. Yeah, I had to mention that because I, I saw you had out with that label. I said, man, I have to ask him about that because we had so much trouble with that. I mean, it was crazy. I did too, yeah. Yeah, it I was such trouble. a frustrating. I, like the, one time the guy uh, the guy was supposed to send me 50 copies and they made a mistake at SPV and they sent me uh, 50 copies on CD of the Tom Petty <laughs> tribute album. <laughs> this is the guy who wow. said that was happening to me, you know? And I'm like, oh, you know, I'm waiting for this fucking Death Strike Live or something. It's Tom Petty. I'm like, dude, I got 50 copies of Tom Petty from SPV. What the fuck is that? Yeah. So I understand. Yeah, it was. It was a, <laughs> I had to ask you about that, but okay. So yeah, two, that was a good question. Yeah. So, so before we get to, I, I definitely want to talk about the the new stuff you have going on, but I want to also mention really fast, um, the cadaveric poison. What can you tell us about that? Because you did what an EP in 2014 and the self titled okay, in 2016. Where uh, the German guys. Uh, uh, these I thought they were older German guys. Which burner guys, right? Yeah, I thought they were older German guys, you know, and I didn't put two and two together and they sent me these two songs and and they said, Paul, you know, we'd love love you to write some lyrics and sing these two songs. What do you think? And I did it. And the EP came out so great. Yeah, Fight for Evil. Again, let's do an album. Okay, now the same now with these guys, they record the album in a real studio. They sent it to me. I went to the vocals in a real studio. And the album is a great album, but again, not much promotion. Not real. A lot of people don't know anything about it. It's really sad because even the people from Nuclear Blast that, that were working for Nuclear Blast told me, Paul, that is a fucking masterpiece of a record. It's short, not too long. Sounds great. We love it. But a lot of people never heard it, yo. And the Wishburner guys are great. You know, I actually just saw them. I had this uh, show with them, Wishburner and Nestrek. Um, live a couple of months ago and check here. Great show. Sold out festival. We had a blast and it was great to see them. We actually got some royalty money from the label because the girl and her husband were there. Not much money. You have 300 bucks or something, but whatever. We were still smiling. I bought some CDs from them as well because I wanted to get more cadaver poison. I'm still trying to sell it at my shows. Nobody buys it. They don't know what it is. Sometimes I sell it online. It's a shame that some things just fall in the cracks and go by the wayside, even when they're good. Yeah. No, you got to do anything else with that band or is that pretty much, or you just, Oh, we just talked about it. So like, that was like maybe seven years or eight years ago, a long time ago. And, uh, they said, Oh, well, you know, we just got which burner back together. Give me a year, Paul. And maybe I'll write a new album. I said, well, if you do it, I'll do it. So keep in touch. Cause I really like the record. I would like to do another record with them. You know, that's definitely, well, we'll see. definitely good stuff. Yeah. Um, so yeah, well, so we'll talk about talking about new records. So we opened the show with the single that is out now, um, "Walk in the Footsteps of Doom." 
So that's yeah. uh, January 19th, right, is going to be the next yeah. – is the date for uh, Saints Dispelled. What can you tell us about that record? Uh, the record was recorded a year ago, and uh, it's got the new drummer on there, obviously, and Alex is back. Peter Peter Bitesy is on there, and Alex is back. Uh, we, re- we rehearsed for like maybe seven months uh, for the 10 songs. We actually spent a long time because the drummer was always busy and didn't want to practice. <laughs> And the guitar player was busy and didn't want to practice. But eventually, we finally got the songs together, went to the studio and recorded them. It was really quick. The whole thing was done in a week. And uh, Hammerheart and Napalm Records said to me, they got the record maybe six months ago, and they said to me uh, that they wanted to really do a good promotion and take their time about it and put it out in January next year. And that's fine. Uh, back in the day, Nuclear Blast would do the same thing. They would spend six months on promotion and then put your record out. And it sold a lot more that way. So I'm hoping, and my fingers crossed, that they're doing the right thing. Maybe they're not, but I'm hoping, you know. But let's face it, they started promotion on the 17th of December, a couple of weeks ago. And a lot of people are buying the, you know, buying the re, the free issues or whatever you want to say, pre-order and and people are checking out the song online and they're getting a lot of good response from people and it looks good. So maybe they were right. We'll see next month or whatever, you know, we'll see how it sells. And the art was hope. done by, uh, was done by Richard who also was the guitar player. Yeah. Solutions, right? Uh, he did many records for me. He did the abomination reissues for nuclear blast as well. He did a, a new version of the devil on that one as well years ago. But yeah, he did solutions. He's been doing some uh, reissues of, master like the demos or whatever he's done four or five records for me over the years and he's such a great artist i had to i, I had to write him i said man i got a really great new album i know it's ready it's time to do a new al- album cover for me and i think he did a great job and what made me smile about it is when he sent me the sketches you couldn't see shit you know he just sent me sketches with a with a pencil you really couldn't see what the fuck it was and i smiled but i knew in my mind this is Richard. He sends you a shitty sketch. It's going to be a masterpiece. And I think he did a great job. Yeah. A week later, he sent me a little more. Then a week later, he sent me the final thing. And and he charged me like maybe, uh, I think, 100 euros for it, which was ridiculous. Wow, really? I know, I, know he's, I know he's like charging other people a lot of money. That's for me, it's like, oh, he sent me 100 euros. I think I sent him 200 euros because I'm that kind of guy. He's my friend. But he did a re- it's a painting. It's not like anything, you know, it's not online bullshit. It's a real painting. He's got the painting, you know, maybe someday he'll give it to me. He probably will, you know. Yeah. Know, or I'll buy it from But I'm just saying, he did a great job, you know? Yeah, you know, and it's funny. We artists, we talk about them a lot too, that, you know, obviously everything has changed so much. And I'm, I'm wondering what's going to happen to the album cover artist because now with this AI, I mean, I don't even know what's real anymore. It's almost like you don't even know what to think, right? I mean, it's yeah. I don't know what these guys are going to do. Yeah, but thankfully, like him, you know, he's he's a painter. You know, he does like the uh, he does the backdrops for the Roadburn Festival every year as well. He paints everything. He's really a painter still, and so I'll be going to him for years, I'm sure. You know? Yeah, it's no a, artificial intelligence. Yeah, you, yeah. That is hard. I will. Ne- I always say I will never use AI, no matter what. All um, right, now that's a good question. I got a question for you. Yeah, uh, that that killer new Judas Priest song. Is that really Halford or is that artificial intelligence? I don't know. Ed, what do you think there? Because yeah, we were talking about that song the last week. This, the only reason I say this, I saw Halford a few times in the last few years. He really was great, but he didn't sound like that new song. Not that you know, here's the here's the problem. I love the guy. I'm Studio gonna be wrong. Magic, He's you old. know how that works, yeah. right? Studio Magic can really enhance. Like, um, I I sent Tony yeah. uh, a live video. It was from forever ago. I think it was the Roadrunner when they had that. All those artists get together and make the record, but it was a live show they put on, and they had Tim Ripper Owens okay. doing Abigail by King Diamond, and he was fucking hitting those notes live. Okay. And I'm thinking to myself. This dude in a studio, you know, like I just, I just recorded um, six songs with Monstrosity for the new record, and uh, and when we were in the studio, yeah, we right. were doing stuff, and and I remember Lee going, "Yeah, this is it sounds because it sounds great." I mean, I you know, uh, but I'm like, and Lee's like, "Don't worry." When they put the little, 
you know, the little special sauce on it when it's done, it'll all be killer. So those guys probably, because they've got Buku backing, probably have jars of special sauce that they get to pour on their shit. So like, and I also watched them doing something. I like the song. There were two. They put out two new songs. And yeah, they put out two new songs. And I was just like, holy shit. Because he's hitting, he's not hitting that painkiller level, but he's singing pretty high for a 70 year old guy. So, yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I mean. Yeah. And like I said, when I saw him live, and when I saw him live, I hit, right. hit yeah, no, I saw it wasn't him. so good, you know. And yeah, he, he was definitely, if you notice, they that. tuned down for Painkiller so that it'll hit his registry. The guitars are tuned down, too. Um, we were just talking. Okay. I love hearing the guy. I love the guy, but you speak about AI. That's what I'm thinking, you know, me and my friends are talking about. Well, I'm not using AI in my vocals. My vocals on the new album are not so great. They're you. They're good. But I'm not using AI. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna make them better. They're me, yo. So you gotta live with it. That's the point. And that's gonna yeah. become a thing eventually. AI on fans are gonna be I mean, it's already everything's already souped up. As as you guys remember, even myself, I you know, I remember the first time I ever recorded it was on tape. You know, it was a totally different world back then. People fucked up and it was part of the record or the drummer had to like play, 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 play. Again, yeah, we yep. had to do the songs and over until play, the drummer you got it right. better know your shit because there was no punching <laughs> in. So, you to play, so, that, yeah, so the idea, yeah, you better know your shit. So we, we had to practice a lot more before he went to the studio. Today, you just hit a button. Me and Tony were talking about the last Kiss show. And then the last thing they did is they came out with that thing saying okay. that they're going to be having... Uh, avatars continue on as kiss and i'm thinking to myself what the fuck are you talking about man you're gonna have fake kiss it's over that's it it's It's done you good night it's over thank you good night there is no more kiss that's it yeah there's no more kiss that's it yeah it's over, man. Give a chance for the give a chance for the next generation. Yeah, That's and I agree. And I grew up. I mean, shit. I grew up on Destroyer and love. I loved that shit when I was a kid. I love but, this stuff. I'm not, I'm not yeah. saying anything bad about it. But that. You're, they didn't even pay. But they didn't even talk about Ace over. or Peter. At the, I mean, it's. I don't know. It's a, well, I thought if they were brought thing. in the younger a younger you know. um, band of people to take over the makeup and you know and they were just kind of saying, hey, listen, somebody else is going to be kissed now. I could at least accept it because it would be real. But avatars, yeah, no. Yeah, well, it would suck. But Still it would say suck, I but... could respect it a little more. No, when I saw that, when I saw that Dio video or whatever, that was disgusting. Ah, uh, who would go see that shit? The hologram. I saw that video with him some years ago. It was disgusting. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, what are they doing? Lemmy's going to be back alive again as an avatar. Don't do that, please. But the problem, Paul, is like we think like this, but in another 20 years when most of us are gone, the new people aren't even going to – it's going to be like a – they're not going to appreciate the, the actually performing. They're not – like we talk about it now. All these young artists, everyone's using tracks or they're – you know, everyone's cheating the whole time. It's like yeah. – I mean I don't know. I like to see if – you, if you fuck up, you fuck up. Like I remember – I have – you know, you listen to records where – you hear the flubs. It's a it's a cool thing, man. You know. Yeah, yeah. And, and actually, the the, drum, uh, the guitar player Alex was saying to me, you know, sometimes the guys fuck up on stage. Okay, so do I sometimes. And I used to get pissed off about it, but the guitar player said to me the other day, Paul, you know, it's live. Who gives a fuck, dude? People like when you fuck up because yes. they know you're not fucking a machine. And he he's right, and you're right too, yo. Know? Yeah, it's you know you're trying to do your best show, but sometimes you hit a wrong note or you trip or you you're drinking your whiskey when they're starting a song that happens to me sometimes and i'm like jumping in you know fucking this is the fucking first line of the song or whatever i'm having a whiskey you know they're not paying attention but, it's part of the live show right yeah it's a live show it's not a computer we had uh who was it ed we had uh john gallagher from raven on like a, i don't know it was a couple weeks ago and he was telling right. me when he saw he saw ozzy on the blizzard tour and randy fucked up what was it uh paranoid I mean, if Randy could fuck up, like he said, anybody could fuck up. It's cool, man. It's okay. Yeah. Like, it's it's not a big deal, Raven. you know? What a great bass player. Yeah, I mean. Raven. Yeah, I mean, actually, we, yeah, that was a – John was great when we had him on here. Um, but, yeah, you've seen, you know, like I said, in a couple – in 20 years, everyone's going to be using tracks or lip singing or whatever the hell they do, you know? It's like you – know, 
Nah, I don't do that. Yo, we, we play it live and hope for the best, yo, whatever. Yeah, you know. There, yeah. We, there, is, there is no intro for Master either. All these other bands, they got intros and they got like um, intros between the songs. My intro is good evening, we're Master. And when the song finished, Old oh, Motorhead style. This is, you know. I go and I uh, grab some whiskey and I approach everybody and we play another three songs and I stop again and walk away from the audience and get something to drink, say something to the drummer and turn around and play again. That's just the way it is. I'm not going to use samples between the songs. I don't care. It can be. It's like a pin drop sometimes, you know, because yeah. I take too long, maybe two minutes or whatever. I don't give a shit anymore. Whatever. What am I going to put a sample? Something going. I don't care, man. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I'm not into it. And you have so I, I do want to. I, I know we've kept you. I don't want to keep you too much longer, but I, I want to ask you. So you, because you've seen some shit. You've been around for a long time, obviously. What is some of the worst promoter? Like, what is? Uh, you don't have to give any names or anything like that, but you know, I know we talk about it with like you know, with, with say if Ed goes on tour, or someone goes with these these stories. These they show up in these countries like and just everything is everything that's supposed to be there is not there. Like it's just a total nightmare. What is one of the worst pr- situations you've had on tour where it's just a total fucking nightmare with the promoter? Oh, we went to Poland. Um, oh, this is many years ago with a, a band from Denmark. And uh, I just remember getting to the show and food came and it was uh, spaghetti with ketchup. <laughs> So there is something was, where yeah. it was at least it wasn't pizza every night, I guess. But it was no, it was like a Tuesday night in Poland. Okay, we're talking like I said, we're talking, you know, maybe twenty years ago, but still, what a nightmare, man! But we ate it. Me and the tour manager burned the guys in the bands and ate it, you know, with a funny face on her, you know. But we ate it because we wanted to show them that you know this is rock and roll. And sometimes you get fucked. I'll never forget that. I'm not a big Big spaghetti, you know. I'm out of big ketchup on spaghetti. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, 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 you had, okay. And the one, thing, the one thing you didn't ask me about was about shows. You know, one show I was so embarrassed for Lemmy. It was uh, the first or second show in Chicago uh, with Brian Robertson, and the guy didn't know the tunes at all. He was dressed in white. He had that short red orange hair. Looked like a total homo. And uh, not I'm, okay. I shouldn't have said that. Maybe. <laughs> it's okay. I'm, okay, I'm not. I'm not politically correct. None of anyway, us are. <laughs> the, guy like, the guy looked like a homo, you know. And uh, I mean, I know he's not. I love the stuff with Thin Lizzy, but he didn't know the songs, and it was the greatest. Lemmy would step on his foot, you know, to get him to make a change or whatever, you know. He didn't know the songs. Oh, He'd only been in the band for a few days. Fast said he just quit. But I felt embarrassed for Lemmy, but Lemmy pulled it off. He played an hour anyway. You know? He played Johnny Be Good and like he's playing all these old blues numbers. And and on the motorhead tunes he kept stepping on Robertson's foot, you know, and Robertson was just fucking up the whole show. <laughs> but Lemmy just stayed with a straight face and played the show because Lemmy's Lemmy, yo. Know? Lemmy is and you know, and Lemmy we talk about actually what we just mentioned too is and you'll put you know, Lemmy, I don't know how Lemmy would do in 2023 because everyone is so fucking sensitive now and everything is so crazy now that like, I mean, I actually heard you talking about how you, you put out the, uh, what was it? The funeral bitch shirts and people were giving you shit about this. Like, it's yeah, just insane. Me a hard time about blowing the fucking demon. It's a great shirt. <laughs> it's insane. Oh man, you, you, can't, you can't have something like that and uh, fuck you, dude. What are you talking about? Great shirt. Yeah, I mean, it's just so different now. Like, I just don't even... Half of the bands that I grew up listening to... Everybody's so sensitive, yo. Everybody's so sensitive about everything. I can't stand it. Is it really? It's sickening. It's it's like, it's it's just such a... I don't know. Everything's political. Like you were saying about, you know, the Bush thing with with, uh, Jay Black or whatever. It's like, over there, they don't worry about it where you guys are. Here, it's like... If if you're they're family members that don't talk to each other because they're politically opposite. To me, that's fucking a travesty, man. Because you know, over something so terrible, stupid, yo. stupid, and all this crazy shit going on over there. The new woke culture, or whatever. Exactly. What the fuck does that mean? Woke culture. Everybody's too sensitive, man. You know, smoking. Who shot a jack? You know what I mean? 
Yeah, being, and being in Europe, you know, I, I don't know about you, but here, politics, uh, it's not like it. No one's fighting over politics here in Lithuania. Like, there's politics, but not everyone's up. Nobody, it's not, a, it's not, a, I don't know. It's never was not up each other's ass over it constantly. It's like, you know, no, I mean. It's uh, different. Yeah, it's just a different. It's more relaxed, bro. Yeah, it's like people, I even noticed in the spring and summer, people enjoy going out more here. They like to go out with the families yeah, yeah, and shit. But the Czech Republic has a lot of a lot of parties, and they're all making a lot of money, and it's shitty. I hate politicians in every country. There's always corruption but everywhere. Yeah, you know, what? There's always corruption everywhere, as you know. Yeah, yeah, that's never going to go away. Here too, you know, we we know that. I mean, look what's happening well, over right. in Russia. You know, yeah, I right. mean, families are, are are totally going against each other all the time about it. It's, a little different over there. Yeah, I mean, look at how it's affected even with yourself with with Master. I mean, nobody knows when they're going to go play Russia again. Nobody, if it's, it's ever going to happen again, you don't know because you know everything's so crazy with every you know with obviously the Ukraine and stuff like that. Now, it's you know, it's, sad. it's just it's sad, and it's not the regular people. The regular people in all these countries want nothing to do with this shit. It's well, all this politics. Yeah. Po- about the money and the politics, the power, yep. you know? Yeah, it's all the higher right. ups. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's terrible, you know. But yeah, well, it's man. time to take. A vote. Yeah, yeah, it's. Well, I, I'm, I'm figuring the state should get really exciting. This next year should be crazy. So we're gonna get ready for another circus over there with all the elections uh, and shit. So can't wait. I don't know, but, but at least. But at least but at least you and I are standing on the outside looking in. Yeah, I mean you're right. Uh, it's it's very true, and it looks a lot different from the outside. I always tell my friends and family, I'm like, you know, yeah. I miss my mom. I mean, I miss my family that's there. But besides that, I mean, you know, here it's a I got three brothers that are there still. I miss them too, of course. Yeah, I do. but the quality of living but, is different. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's know. why I'm here still. You know, 23 years later, I'm not going anywhere. Yeah, no, I mean. Yeah, no, Paul, we really appreciate you coming on and hanging out with us tonight, man. man. I I hope I wasn't talking too much shit. (laughs) No, dude, no, 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 man, no. And you've always been, I mean, I have Halloween decorations going off in the background, sorry. Oh, perfect. (laughs) You know, it's like my my audience in here. But, uh, you know, but no, I mean, you know, now it's, like I said, we live in a, a time now where everyone's just afraid to say anything, man. It's like, just be yourself, speak your mind. I mean, it's just, That's you know, me, yo. and and you've always been videos. like that. If you look at any Paul back in the day, like, you know, I actually, I remember, which actually that we're, before we let you go, I know John, the singer of War Cry passed away this year. Right. I, I think he passed yeah, was, away in yeah. June, yeah. but I had read an interview with him and he had said, he goes, Paul had one goal to be heavier. When you left, when you left War Cry, he said, he goes, First of all, he commented, he said how bad of a base, bad as a bass player you were, but he also said, he goes, Paul just wanted to be heavier and have, be the heaviest thing around. I mean, you know, I don't know if you saw that interview, but there's an interview with him back, an old War Cry interview from some Chicago newspaper. Rich. Yeah, yeah, Rich Rosick, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he Rich. said, he goes, yeah, Paul always had his, he was very focused. There was never, you, you always, you had this focus. So it's it was noticed back then even too, so. You know, but I'm still underground, you know. I'm still not rich and famous. I'm still underground, but I don't care, you know. You did it your way. I've had a good forty years of rock and roll, you know. know? Absolutely. Yeah, and Master's always got shit out. You always see Master shirts, jogging pants. It's like there's, you know, there's Master everything out. (laughs) It's like you know, (laughs) you you, you need a podcast just to sell shit, man. You'd be schooling that. But uh, yeah, great to hear. Great to talk to you guys and. Yeah, man. Great on that monstrosity new album, too. Congratulations. I'm looking forward to hearing Thanks, it. man. Yeah, cool. it should be out sometime this coming year. Tell the guys I said hello to, you Absolutely. know. Absolutely. Of course. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. And, Excellent. Paul, anything That's else good. you want to promote? Web pages? You can say whatever no, you no, want here. Well, if the, somebody wants to find information, just go to specmetal.net, and there's all kinds of information there. Boom. There you go. And new record out January 19th. Saints Dispelled yeah. on Hammerheart Records. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah. yeah. Well, you guys, I, I, Paul, thanks for uh, hanging out. We'll say goodbye to you on the way out when we hang up this interview. But uh, everybody who listens. Right. Let's finish this one up. And uh, I got to piss. <laughs> there you go. Yes, exactly. You I'll guys, right back. You go piss and me and Ed will say goodbye while you're, you're pissing. Uh, <laughs> right. Ed? What's up, man? So where can they find us at? Apple Music, Spotify, 
Amazon, uh, YouTube, and then Facebook and Instagram. You know, if you want to message us and then the Tampa morgue at gmail.com. That's pretty there much you know, like everything I know of. I wish we could get somebody else to say that stuff. Hint, hint. We're working on that. I know. We're working I know on we that. are. We're always um, working on shit. But. Yeah, we're always working on shit. Yeah, we don't even know when. So we'll, we'll probably be on next week. We don't really – I haven't booked anything yet, so I'll work on that. We have some guests that we're waiting to figure out and it's stuff. It's Christmas, but, um, man. We're going to – we got family. Yeah, it might slow down a little bit, you know, because, you know, everybody's doing different shit. So I know we got, like, two guys that will probably come on this month just waiting for the days for that. But uh, we appreciate everybody who listens. Like I said, we're a work in progress, but uh, we're getting the show, you know, where we want it to be. Hey, man, who would have thought and we would be 23 shows deep by yeah, the end of 23, episodes. you know, 2023. So we started this out and look at the people we've had on. I mean, Paul, yeah, it's been it's it's been a rush, man. So keep Count Gore Duvall. Yeah, you know, man, we've, we've had, had a we've lot had of little, people you know, on this thing, man. Blaine it's, Cook and stuff. So we've been getting excellent. it done, but uh, – Let's uh, you know, keep it going. Super. Yeah. and uh, yeah, Keep it going. Yeah. And Paul's back with us after the piss. So we're going to go now. And Paul, thanks for coming Thank on again, so man. Much. Like I said, we'll, we'll say goodbye to you when Thank we hang up this. But everybody else, thanks for listening. Paul, any words on the way out? Yeah. You got to pee at 60 more often. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, like to, I like to say everybody, you know, like some guys are like, they give you hell to shows and stuff. And I'm like, man. I like to see where you're at at six. Yes. How exactly. many times you're waking up at night? Well, I'm out there touring and still playing my music and having a good exactly. life. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It, obviously, rock and roll keeps you young. You know. I agree. Definitely. Just everyone, when you're pissing in the bathrooms at the shows, wash your hands because I always think to myself, how many when you have time you shake someone's hand? Oh my god. <laughs> oh man. How many oh, dicks? <laughs> yeah, wash your hands. <laughs> Uh, like mom said wash your hands yeah Yeah. wash your hands but uh thanks everybody for listening we'll be back next week thanks paul again and uh you you all have a good night thanks for listening to tampa morgue see ya